Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Hey, are we all good, Jack61? We, yes, we are. We're, we're good to go. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Fantastic. Well, look, guys, welcome. Uh, welcome to our weekly podcast. It's great to be here. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you know, guys, uh, what we're doing is we continue uh, the Reading with the Crew uh, podcast series, uh, whereby we are, well, actually, Neverly is reading out uh, various chapters from a John Farrax book, um, The Wrecking Crew. And at the moment, we're on episode number eight, which is <laughs> truly remarkable. And um, all of us from the Foul Play team would like to thank you guys for your great support uh, in all the podcasts that we do. And we're really, really happy uh, that you guys have received a uh, reading with the clue, crew, <laughs> reading with the clue, uh, really positively. And a lot of you guys are watching the uh, podcast series. And as always, guys, just to let you know, we are reading specific chapters from John Farrakh's book. And as a proviso, uh, we like to tell you that these represent John Farrakh's thoughts. They don't necessarily represent what we think um, on the Foul Play team. And I'm sure Jack61, Neverly and Alice will back me up. It is very important that if you're going to be a student of the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey cases, you've got to go way beyond making a murderer, right? You really have to deep dive into the documents, the official court documents, the trial documents. And uh, as you know, many people from the foul play team, Jack 61, Sunshine Christina, um, are spending a lot of time uh, foying documents. Uh, these are documents that very few people have and uh, we're presenting these documents um, uh, as part of podcast series. So it's very important that you keep an open mind. All of us do. Uh, none of us on the Foul Play team are all the same. Uh, we have different ideas, different theories, et cetera, et cetera. But the important thing is that we have a cordial, open discussion, right? That's the most important thing. You know, we're here to find out the truth, like all of you guys are. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate that. We don't have all the answers. We don't We don't believe that, you know, we're trying to work out exactly what happened that fateful day uh, to Teresa. Um, we do believe in the innocence of Stephen and Brendan Dassey, but we have open minds. Uh, and that's why we're presenting a podcast like this so that we can uh, elicit chat, discussion, so you can formulate your own opinions. So at the moment, uh, we're on podcast number eight uh, with the Reading with the Crew uh, podcast series, and we're on chapter 25 if you're following the podcast series. I really do, and I'm sure Jack61 and everyone else will back me up. It's a really good book. Um, is it perfect? No, no books are perfect but it really does promote really good discussion, I believe, by John Farrakh. Uh, he was right on the money, uh, wrote up a lot of really good stuff. And we're on chapter 25 entitled Computer Disk, right? And so just to bring everybody into the picture, uh, you know that Kathleen Zellner had put in a, a filing, a recent filing, in which essentially she's looking at Bobby Dassey as a third party uh, Denny. Denny suspect, right? So what we have done and what Neville is doing at the moment is that we're looking at highly specific chapters that look at Bobby Dassey, right? Now, none of us here on the channel are saying Bobby Dassey did anything, right? But we're looking at it from a legal standpoint. Uh, when Kathleen Zona presented her new filing, filing does um, Bobby Dassey satisfy all the prongs of the Denny, right? And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue reading chapter 25, which is on the computer disk, which is about the computer disk. So as you know, uh, both Fassbender and Wiget had a search warrant. They went to the Dassey residence and they confiscated the computer. Uh, when Fassbender and Wiget uh, showed up, 
uh, they called Barb, and both Barb and I believe her son Blaine uh, ran into the house uh, very quickly, and uh, Barb started pulling out cords from the back of the computer. Uh, quite clearly, she was, I believe, concerned um, about the computer. Now, we don't know whether Barb knows the contents of that computer, but that's the reason why we're here. We're really looking at what did the investigators find on that computer disk that made uh, everyone so concerned? And so, look, guys, welcome to the channel. Welcome to the chat. Uh, if you like what we do, please subscribe. Um, and if you like our podcast, leave your DNA on the thumbs up button. I assure you, and everyone on the panel assures you, <laughs> Cherie Cohane would not get access to your DNA. <laughs> right, Jack61? <Jack> <laughs> won't, get, won't get access to your DNA. And again, guys, thank you so much for all the support. As you know, we do uh, a lot of different podcasts here on the channel. And I'd just like to say it was great to see Sunshine Christina back for her uh, Crime Theory Exchange podcast. Uh, she tackles a lot of controversial topics. Please uh, give us support. Um, view the podcast. Give a thumbs up if you enjoy them. And again, guys, you know, we're not perfect. We do this uh, out of love. None of us get paid. We do this because we want to ask um, some hard questions and we really love the feedback that you guys give us. If there's anything that we can do to improve the podcast, things that you'd like to discuss on the channel, please let us know. Uh, also, of course, Jack61 uh, with his excellent open mics. Um, again, it's if you've been listening to them, you too will be very, very upset uh, with the way Fassbender and we get highly targeted uh, Jody Stokowski. And uh, there's, they have no moral compass. Uh, what that lady went through, the degree of questioning is just completely shocking. And again, guys, uh, check out the Open Mic Podcast. Well, look, welcome, guys. Uh, my name is Dr. Silkman, and I'm from the Foul Play team. As per usual, I like to introduce um, our panel members uh, just very, very quickly so we can start the podcast. First, I'd like to introduce Jack61. Jack61, welcome to the podcast. Hello, panel, and welcome everyone in uh, the loud chat. Thanks for coming. And yep, I have to say that uh, it's been an interesting, it was an interesting little project with Jody. Uh, it was a little side project, I guess, that spurred my interest because of the jail visit calls, the inter the multiple interviews that we have, and the multiple interviews we don't have. There are a bunch that we don't have at all uh, that yeah. I've, I've requested several and have been told that they don't exist. So the November 5th interview that uh, Bessler, Bessler at MTSO and the other officer, whoever it was, uh, we have no idea what was said. Nothing. So, and there's others too that uh, we don't really have any we have a report, but I don't always believe the reports. In fact, they have they have the you know the ink pen in their hand. They can write whatever they want. So we need the audio. So Correct. anyway, yeah, right, yep. It was an interesting project, and uh, you know, hopefully, we can add to it as time goes on. Correct, and uh, you know, thank you so much, Jack Sixty One, for presenting uh, those podcasts. Uh, it's amazing. Look, guys. Um, this happened many, many years ago, but we're still learning new stuff, right? It's amazing when you when you discover the aggressive line of questioning uh, by Fassbender and Wiegert on yes. Jody, and uh, it was nonstop, it was uh, incessant, and there was a plan in place for Jody, right? There's no, no doubt. No and doubt. All you got to do is have a, all you got to do is have a look at the original court documents by Kratz what he had in mind and uh, they had it all prepared. So it was pretty shocking when you yeah. consider that Jody wasn't there prior, during and after the murder of Teresa Horbach. And yet the way she was treated, uh, they had a means to an end. It was, it was truly, truly shocking. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Jack 61. Excellent series of podcasts. And next uh, we have Neverly. Neverly, welcome. How are things Thank coming you, Dr. Along? Stoutman. 
Um, yes. Hello, everybody on the panel. And in the chat, we have 43 yes. people. Yes, it's popping. So, um, no, it's great to be here. And, you know, guys, um, we are all, all of us are still scratching our heads. We wish that we could be more definite in our theories and um, kind of, I wish that we could definitely eliminate certain aspects and certain documents presented, but we can't because there's so much that we do not know. And if you remember last uh, week, I compared this case to um, to the iceberg, you know, what's seen above the, um, the line of uh, water is just what yeah. ma'am showed and everything beneath in the vast uh, uh, ocean, the depth of the ocean, there's a huge part. And that's what we're trying yeah. to chip away at that and kind of figure out what the hell happened, you know? So it's very, very frustrating for all of us. And we're just going, as we learn something, we go with that, trying to fit where it could be, you know, process of elimination. And uh, God knows that some people have excellent memory and um, some people are great at spreadsheets to keep, you know, all the information kind of at the right. fingertips, like our brother Yoris. He, brother Yoris. He's Correct. also known as the spreadsheet man. So yeah, very, very frustrating. And uh, I just wish that we could say, okay, well, it definitely wasn't Bobby. We would love to say that, but Kathleen Zellner has a job to do. And James Crane in chat, also known as Yoga for the Ageless, yes. said uh, that people, some people do not understand that Kathleen Zellner has a job to do, which is to get her client exonerated and she will do whatever right. it takes. Whether Bobby did or not, we wish that he didn't because it's bloody awful. But uh, right. we'll see. We'll see. Correct. And it's been all these years, my goodness. And where are we, you know? Where are we in all of this? We still have so many theories. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Other than that, and thank God we're not addicted. Thank God we're not addicted. <laughs> yeah. No, we're not, we're not addicted yeah. at all. Uh, I really liked your iceberg analogy as well. Uh, and um, groups like us, like Foul Play and many other excellent YouTubers are slowly chipping away at that iceberg. Uh, and it's amazing what happens when you get more documents coming in uh, and you uh, are able to study them uh, and see and see what they for what they are. And we are very lucky on the Foul Play team. And you mentioned uh, Brother Uriz uh, and also Zoe. And there are also other, the super mods as well, who do an, a truly excellent job. You know, we would not be here today, guys, without all the people that work in the background. You may not see their faces, you may not see their names, but they do a really excellent job behind the scenes. Uh, and guys, it's all for free. Come, come to our YouTube channel. We have a lot of documents. We have a lot of presentations. Um, and not only just the Stephen and Brendan Dassey cases, but also many other cases as well. And uh, uh, Jack61 and both myself, we've been, we did the Nick Hillary case and we've had some excellent discussions with his attorney, right? Uh, Mani Tafari. And so we're very blessed and we're very happy that we have been able to have those discourses with, with, the, with his attorney. And uh, it's created a lot of chat, a lot of controversy. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that by watching these podcasts, you too would do your own independent research and branch out. And you never know if there's a presentation you want to do. Guys, let us know. You might even get an invite on one of our podcasts, right? And also, uh, as Neverly alluded to, we have a very vast library of documents as well uh, on many, many cases that's brought about through the hard work of Zoe and others who put it all together. And also we have a very active Discord channel. <laughs> Someone's always there to discuss um, whether there was one RAV, two RAVs, three RAVs, you name it. And it's good. It's cordial discussion. I want, we all want Discord, in fact, the Foul Play team, people to be um, free to discuss whatever they want, right? Be cordial, be respectful, and, you know, chat away. 
Okay, and finally, uh, I'd like to introduce Alice. Alice, how are things coming along? And don't Hi. talk about don't talk about British politics, whatever you do. No, <laughs> oh, don't go there, Doc. What fucking politics? We've not got any of the new. <laughs> correct, correct. Almost oh, as bad as it I mean, that's it, Doc. Everybody must be laughing at us right now, you know what I mean, with the way bloody things have gone on, you know what I mean? Changing prime ministers as quick as we change our liquors, you know what I mean, at the moment. So, um, but, yeah, no, everything's good, uh, my end, Doc. Um, apart from being annoyed with my bloody smoke alarms, I couldn't join on Wednesday <laughs> because my problems with them gone off automatically. Damn not in. But thank you for asking. And hello to everyone in chat. It's fabulous to see all these people in chat. And we'll get to say hello to you all in a few minutes. Thanks, Doc. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And look, guys, we all of us would like to welcome we in chat. We have TTM Fangirl. We've got uh, Gloria. We've got Angie Dickinson. Welcome, guys. We've got Shane Henry, Nan's Life 7, uh, Andy B. Anthony D, uh, we've got Pete, Pete Moss, I love that name, we've got Jazznaz Gaming, awesome, uh, who else have we got, uh, we've got Jeff Jones, hey, welcome, and uh, make sure that you uh, support Jeff Jones uh, and his channel, um, as you know, both Jack61, myself, Kelly, and also Big Jeff, and Jeff Jones, uh, we're part of a panel, a special panel, where we're discussing uh, MAM 2. And I'll tell you what, all of us have uh, seen MAM, MAM 1 and MAM 2 probably 10 or 20 times, yet we still find little gold nuggets. And uh, we're all different. All of, right, Jack61? We're not all we're not all clones of each other. Absolutely and I'll not. Tell you what, we disagree yep. sometimes. And you just got to agree yep. to disagree and move on, you know? Correct, correct. And look, I'm so glad to be part of that team, that panel, because the discussions are very cordial and they go into a lot of depth and they really complement what we're doing at the moment as well on the Foul Play uh, team. And it's just fantastic. And I really love the way uh, Jeff goes about his podcast, the way he puts it all together. So give him some love. Also, Just Rhonda and her channel and Becca Chu as well. And if I've missed anybody out, I'm, I'm sorry. Let Mystic, us know. Mystic so, Jinxie. Ah, uh, yes. And Mystic Jinx, another excellent researcher as well. Cherie Lynn Pontillo. Oh, my God. Um, the stuff that they uncover and discover is truly phenomenal, right? And, uh, you know, they're all part of the Foul Play team, the Foul Play group, and that's awesome. So give them some love, give them some support. And uh, who else we got? We got uh, Anthony Hills. We've got Case 10. Uh, welcome. Hey, we've got Catnit, uh, Supermod. Um, we've got Rhonda SD. Welcome. Uh, B.W. Haggis has joined us. Oh, we've, awesome. We've oh, we've got, got Kate, James uh, Crane. James yeah, Crane we've got. James is yoga for the ageless. Ah, uh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Oh, and and uh, TTM fangirl became a, f a member for ten months. Yes, Fang and she also gifted. She also gifted five members, five people to become members of the channel as well. So That's thank fantastic. you so much, TTM. Thank it's you, very, TTM. very much. Yeah. And it's very, very generous of you. Um, so thank yeah. you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, Fantastic. We've got Kelly. Kelly. Kelly's in the house. Welcome, Kelly. Yeah. Jackie's uh, in I'm, the house. I'm... Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and Angie if I've missed Yep, Mystic Jinx. Yes, yes. Darkside. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, Darkside as well. We've got a lot of people in chat. Well, look, guys, Just what would you do? <laughs> yes, yes. And apologies if we've missed anybody out. And guys, like I said, if you've got any questions in chat, um, I think Alice will monitor the chat and we'll try and answer your questions the best that we can. All right, guys. So is everybody happy we can actually make a start on the podcast, podcast proper? Absolutely. Yeah? Yep. Awesome. So, guys, if you're following this, we're on slide number nine. Give me just one second, I'll pull that down. Yep. 
no worries and Neverly will continue and what we do is if there's something we want to discuss if there's something you you guys want to discuss in chat uh let us know because we'll stop we'll stop the podcast and we'll discuss it right but there's no time limit here we're not on a race uh we love your input and your input is very very important for us right because we don't know all the answers and there's an incredibly amount of great researchers in chat who've been following the Avery and Dassey cases and other cases for a long period of time. And we, we thank you so much for your support. Okay, um, so what we'll do, uh, we'll make a start. Neverly, you've got the slide ready? Yes, I'm ready, Dr. Silvan. Okay, let's go for it, guys. Okay. Then a decade later, on July 15, 2017, a new Brady witness, Kevin Ramlow, in two affidavits came forward and described how he had remembered seeing Ms. Halbach's rap on November 3rd and 4th, 2005, by the old dam on State Highway 147 and reporting this to Sergeant Andy Colburn. The RAV 4 was located within a half a mile of Scott Tadich's former and current residences. Okay. Then on... Okay. Yeah. So it again, you know, we have discussed all of this stuff before, right? In a lot of great detail. In later chapters, uh we will we will go over this again, but just keep in the back of your mind that um there were missing uh persons posters placed all over the place and Ramlo just happened to see one at the Senex gas station and he had mentioned now he said it was Colburn but apparently it could have been another officer that looked a lot like Colburn could have been present at the Senex station the important thing is is that you have now independent witnesses who they believe saw Teresa Horbach's RAV4 off the property, right? Off the property. Uh, this potentially is a big problem, right, for the state and their hypothesis. Because according to the state, as we all know, Teresa nor her RAV4 left the property. Just my one final point, sorry, Neverly, is where the RAV4 was found in terms of sighted it was very close to scott tadich's home not implying anything nefarious here but it's very interesting where ramlo saw that rav4 a uh, jack 61 you want to make a comment on that <laughs> on where the rav4 was potentially seen by ramlo Oh, yeah, it was uh, it was just you know within a mile or whatever or or so at um, at, at that one forty seven I, I can't remember the other name at the uh, near the dam. Yes, isn't that right? Yes, correct. Near the turnaround, which is about a mile mile and a half from Scott's trailer. And I'm not saying Scott had anything to do with it. I'm just saying that. That's where it was, and we can't change that. That's factual. Yeah, that's a fact. Th that's right. Correct. Uh, and uh, my final question to the panel is, um, where was Bobby Dassey going hunting on the 31st of October 2005? Does anyone yeah. remember this? That was behind, behind Scott's trailer. For, but, you know, and, yeah. and, that, behind, and that in itself was a little – it was unusual because uh, normally he went hunting with um, – Marco, and Marco, that's yeah, Osmondson. Yeah, uh, correct, correct. So the just keep in your back of your mind. We're not insinuating anything, but everything appears to be local, right? So you've got Ramlo who cited the Rav Four or a vehicle that looks similar to Teresa Horbach's uh, car uh, near the turnaround, and it just so happened to be very close to where Scott Tadich lived, right? And very interestingly. Uh, Bobby Dassey said that he was going hunting behind the property of Scott Tadich. So it's very, very interesting indeed. But the All most right. interesting part for me is that it's away from Steven's property. Uh, that's correct. 
That's correct. And according to the state, there's no way anybody should be seeing either Teresa or her RAV4 anywhere outside the Avery Salvage Yard. Guys, does everyone agree with that? <laughs> according to the state, Teresa never left the property. Yeah. That's right. Even that right, that, had that, I should have been looking at it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. So keep that in the back of your mind. So, uh, Neverly, would you like to continue yes. uh, reading? Thank you. Then on July 31st, 2017, Zellner retained forensic computer expert Gary Hunt to analyze the seven DVDs taken from Bobby Das's hard drive. Mr. Hunt examined the seven DVDs and discovered an abundance of violent pornography and created a timeline that linked the majority of the searches for violent pornography to Bobby. Uh, Neverly, sorry guys, sorry for interrupting all the time. So, as you know, what what the investigators did, what Fassbender and Wigert did, was they confiscated the computer, right? Or, as you all know in chat, uh, all the information, all the pertinent information is present on the hard drive. So they obviously cloned the hard drive. In other words, they dumped the entire contents of the hard drive. They cloned it or ghosted it. But they also copied all the information on the hard drive on uh, seven DVDs, right? And I think a DVD um, contains about 4.7 gigabytes um, of space. So they had seven DVDs, which potentially means a lot of information had been dumped on those DVDs. And my final point is this, and this is a relevant point, right? If you notice what Neverly uh, just read out, and I'll quote, uh, discovered an abundance of violent pornography and created a timeline that linked a majority of the searches for violent pornography to Bobby. Now, guys, we all know that Bobby Dassey wasn't the only person that was living in that I was that just going to say that, yeah. Correct. Right. There were, there, there were his brothers there as well. Potentially, there are visitors, friends. That can come over as well. And Bob was living there as well, right? So Scott Tadich could have come over. Anybody could have come over. So it's this point here is crucial, guys. I can't emphasize it enough how important it is. If you're pointing a finger at Bobby Dassey, looking at the violent pornography, the torture porn, et cetera, et cetera, you've got to ensure that it's specifically only Bobby Dassey that could be downloading and viewing this material. Guys, everybody on the panel agree? Yeah. Everybody in chat agree. Is that, Absolutely. Is that Absolutely. a fair assumption? It is. Correct, right? So as yep. you know, if you're going to make a bold statement that Bobby Dassey and only Bobby Dassey was downloading and viewing this material, you have to prove it was him and nobody else. Right. So that's the point I want to make, that if you're pointing the finger at Bobby, it basically meant that Bobby Dassey likely was by himself uh, looking at this material. If anybody else was home. Yeah. And Grand Moss just said it was in his bedroom. Exactly. Okay. So he was actually the prime suspect if they found all of that on his computer and it's in his room, and it's during the time that he would be awake or, you know, had a chance to do that while everybody else was at school and at work, then it makes sense. I believe with four boys in that room, four curious boys, they were all teenagers, right? That what are the chances that the younger ones would be watch looking for or have that morbid curiosity to look for all those, you know, I, I read for five freaking minutes, all these searches, there were ex explicit words left and right. It was, oh, I felt like I needed a soap in my mouth. <laughs> and, seriously. We, we felt, we so, felt that way too. <laughs> yeah. So it was really, yeah. So uh, right. what are the chances that the younger ones would be looking at that? I don't know. Well, and, and, and not only, um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just 
briefly, not only the four brothers, but um, we have to consider that uh, Travis was probably over, and I can't remember the other kid's name. There was at least one or two others that uh, I'm sure that came and visited. So who's to say that they weren't also on the computer? They say, oh, man, look at this. You check this out. So, yeah, absolutely. Look, correct, correct. Nobody has a magic wand or a crystal crystal ball or a time machine. They are doing the best that they can. And uh, I don't think that we are in a position to nitpick who watched when and how because we weren't actually there. As uh, Jack just said, it could have been, hey, look at this. This is gross or this is bad or whatever. You know, they would decide how impressed they were whatever they were looking for but you got to do the best that you can hey zelmer has a job to do she hired right. all these experts we are not the experts and she's i'm sure just like anybody else tailoring the searches to her danny suspect correct is it possible that everybody else you know all the other boys and were looking at that yes it's possible but is it Correct. probable? We don't know. Yeah. And yes, we expect the state to rip Zellner apart and blah, blah, all of that we know. So we're just going to go with it and see what Correct. comes out. But yeah. nobody, yeah. none of us can claim for certain that we know exactly who did what and when. No. And the, it, it, yeah, sorry, sorry, Alice. Continue. Well, Nan's life uh, says in chat, she says, and if they get away with faking blood results and a host of other misgivings by law enforcement, who is to say that what is on those seven CDs actually came from that actual computer? Um, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have you have to actually prove it, right? I mean, you've got to understand that someone doing computer analysis can determine whether things have been fudged, whether things have been faked. The problem is when you um, confiscate um, a hard drive, um, everywhere you go, everything you download, everything you view um, is documented and timestamped because Windows has got a registry, right, Jack61? So therefore, uh, it's a very highly strict hierarchy and order in a computer disk. That's right. Very, very hard to fudge, right? And don't forget the um, CD, the um, hard drive was examined by Vieli uh, and also by um, Hunt as well. So it was done independently as well. Um, so you'll be able to tell, a computer forensic expert will be able to tell whether there's been fudging going on and they can determine whether there have been attempts to try and uh, blank the hard drive and uh, for reformat the hard drive. So they've got all the appropriate tools to determine the integrity of that computer hard drive, right? So uh, like I said, there's a registry. And the other important thing is this, guys. Don't forget your ISP your service internet service provider has an exact record of what you're doing and downloading and what you're viewing. And I know that in the Australian government, this was years ago, there was pressure put on to the ISPs that they had to keep a, a person's search history for I think a period of two to four years. I don't know about the US, but that certainly happened in Australia. And a lot of people were up in arms uh, so if you're undergoing a criminal investigation, potentially they can go to your ISP and they have to provide all the material that you've looked at and downloaded. There's a record, right? And there are things called cache files, right, Jack61? Cache, computer cache. And in the computer cache is a log of every activity you do. Correct, Jack 61. Yeah, generally, you know, if you look at the registry, and I'm no expert, guys, I'm just kind of a nerd, but if you look at the Windows registry, even back then, you know, when you do something, uh, it's generally recorded in uh, at least two locations, if not multiple locations, more than two. Yeah. 
Yep, correct. Well, between between Jenks and Kelly, they say they're saying that Bobby wasn't the only one that was in the uh, the house. Bobby wasn't the only one that was doing the uh, the searches. Uh, Blaine was home during some of the searches that she claims are only Bobby's. Uh, Blaine spell words specifically that you see searched also on the 31st, which are not timed. Um, so between yeah. Ke- Kelly says people don't want to see the differences with the computers. Um, yeah. There was no lock on Bobby's room. Uh, if it was Bobby's room and not the boy's room. Um, yeah, I mean, we can't be certain who was in that room, whether it was Bobby, the both the boys, or the boys, or just Bobby. But from the facts that Kathleen has been able to access and the timings, the timings work out that Bobby was the only one that was in that house at the time of the searches, because Barb was at work and the other boys were at school. So Bobby is the only one that could have done these searches on the 31st at the times that she's saying. Um, and also, we welcome Bob. Bob's in chat. Thank you for yeah. joining us, Bob. Hi, Barb. Well, Thank you. Welcome. Um, you know that we are, we're not accusing them or anything like that, Barb. We're just following the evidence and the way things have been going, you know. Correct. And for what Kathleen has been able to gather through her experts in that is that Bobby was the one that was in the house on the times and the boys and that were at school. Because even Brendan says that he got off the bus way Blaine after school. So he's been at school, he's not been at home. You know what I mean? So he said that Blaine was at home, does that mean you're calling Brendan a liar? Because Brendan says him and Blaine got off the bus, they walked up the road, they went to the house, they went in, they played some computer games, and then he went to Stevens. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Lying about that part, you know yeah. what I mean. So Bobby was the only one that was in the house at that time. Um, for what Kathleen has been able to pull up and everything like that, you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah, the well, the the thing is, is that well, we don't want to be sidetracked. Who did what? We're just reading what was found, what the experts found. Right, so we can only report. We can we can hypothesize, but the important point I want to make is this: if you're pointing a finger at Bobby, uh, downloading uh, torture porn, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you have to ensure that it was only Bobby present at specific times in the house. I'll I'll tell you right now. The state will reject. Any searches done if anybody else was in that house, guys? Do you yeah. agree? Is that yeah. fair? Absolutely. So even even if the cat was in the house, yeah. the state will say, "How can you be certain it was just Bobby looking and downloading at this material?" And don't and Jackson don't explains, you and, yeah, don't think they won't look either because they will. Yep. Yep. Correct. Correct. So we know we know what time Blaine and Brendan go to school, right? So anything when they're home, you cannot include in your searches to say it's Bobby. Because if anyone else is home, it could be any of them. And if you read the testimonies, and we have, um, I think Brendan and Blaine have said they there were times they're on the computer. Right, they admitted using the computer. The computer is in a, is in Bobby's room, but I'm sure the other bedrooms are very close by, right? And so I would imagine that all the boys 
would use the computer, right? Now, my understanding, and I hope I'm, uh, hope I'm not wrong, is that the computer was password protected. And Stephen had his own computer, right? So I don't think Stephen would come over and use the computer because remember, Bobby is home during the day. He goes to work at night time, right? So I just wanted to emphasize that if you're pointing a finger at Bobby, it's only at times when Bobby Dassey is home by himself. Otherwise, it's a no-show, right? And that that's all I want to say about that. Guys, is that fair enough? Is that fair enough? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know, I know that Barbara said, well, maybe the law enforcement officers switched the hard drives or did something. We can't comment on that, right? Because that's another controversial theory that maybe they swapped the hard drives. But I'm telling you right now, if any swapping was going to be done, that would have ensured that all of that material was on your brother's computer, Bob on Stevens. Right? Guys, do you agree? If they're uh, if they're if they're pointing a finger at Stephen um having committed this murder against Teresa and you're thinking about computer swapping, uh swapping hard drives, the state would have ensured that, that material was on Stephen's computer, not on the DASI computer. Jack sixty one. Yeah, that that gets into what we were talking about earlier and yeah. Windows having the ability to, you know, uh, the the registry. I, I'm just telling you, it, it it would be so difficult to insert something after the fact and cover your tracks forensically that an expert Correct. wouldn't see it. Uh, really Correct. difficult. I, and again, guys, I'm no expert at this at all. Just in you know, years and years of fooling with Windows and all that kind of thing. Uh, and also, um, you know, at the time frame, it, it, remembering what Uyghur said, what they expected to find. Remember, Doc? But he, That's correct. In in the newspaper clipping as well. Yeah. He yes. said he's expected to find all this stuff on Stephen's computer. But I, will, I do want to make a comment that no matter what we think uh, may or may not have happened, what is really fucking strange <laughs> is that they kept that computer for five months. That's a long time. You're damn right. They didn't need that long. And I, I, other than play keep away or some other, maybe something even more nefarious, as in putting some information on that hard drive in some capacity, I don't know how they would do it. But other than playing keep away, man, it, it's hard yeah. to imagine that. Here's a, one last thing, and I'll, I'll mute. Uh, the state has not... Uh, as far as I know, they have not turned that second forensic uh, examination over to Zelma. I don't think they the ever. The one with the computer from Bob? And That's Scott, right. The second yeah. time? That's yeah. right. I don't think they've Correct. ever turned it over, right? Uh, that I don't know. Maybe, um, I mean, that was a very, very strange situation. And I know that Bob, Bob is in chat um, and we we played that recording um and i could not believe that deedring had asked barb and scott if they can have the computer again yeah and then they told they told her not to give it to zelma right yeah. to get rid it's, of it yeah i mean it's that's it's almost that's almost Correct. tampering to me again that's right that's brushing right up against what i mean i think Correct. the scope of law enforcement should do uh to you know it, it that goes right back to the shit that they pulled on jody I mean, Correct. my God, man, how far are you going to go to play judge, jury, and executioner uh, b before somebody says, wait a minute, guys, that's not, yeah, that's not your job, you know. But, yeah, with all that, yes. keeping that computer for five months, I, I'm just saying, it, it's they didn't need that long. Yeah, correct. So we know, we know that that computer was a communal computer. It was used by a lot of the boys in the house and probably friends that have come over and a computer can be used for a lot of things of course playing games uh, doing homework uh, communicating with others but there is no doubt that there was a huge amount 
of pornographic material. Some regular. Most people won't even raise an eyebrow, right? Uh, regular. Uh, these boys, they're young, right? They're looking up stuff. They, you know, they they want information. They're curious. Um, 99.99% of people on earth do that. I don't think that's a major issue for me personally. But what is of a deep concern are the uh, searches for hardcore pornography involving torture and pain, mutilation, death. Guys, I'm sure, and we've discussed it before, I don't consider that normal. Maybe if you're curious, you may look up maybe one or twice and go, that's revolting, or that's shocking. But a persistent viewing of this material, to me, uh, is of deep concern. Uh, Jack61. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly what you just said. If it was a couple of times, you know, out of, you know, some morbid curiosity, you know, the, it's kind of like driving by a bad car wreck and the rubbernicking saying somebody's tore apart, that kind of thing, you do it and you move on and you're done, right? But that's not what yes. we have here. It's, it's like you said, it's multiple entries, multiple. Correct. That, that's, that's a problem. If it was one or two. Like I said, the story that my daughter told me years ago, what, what the kids were doing in high school, Yep. In high school, in class, with their mobile phones, they were going to Rotten.com and they were finding the most gruesome pictures. But they were sharing and laughing and carrying on because they were trying to outgross each other. But if someone had five, ten thousand images of the same of the same type of material, um, you start to wonder, right? But again, we're not so forensic psychologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're just reporting what had been found. And just one thing, if you're a forensic analysis, you do computer forensic analysis, you know what metadata to look at to ensure that that computer belongs to that person, right? And let me tell you a funny sto a quick funny story. That's exactly how they caught the BTK killer. That's right. right? That's right. That's exactly how they caught the BTK killer who had killed, I think, 10 or 11 people over a long period of time, right? Brutal killings. And he sent the press or the police a computer disk, a blank computer disk. On that computer disk, unknown to the BTK killer, was the metadata that had the place of origin where the disk came from. It was a church and the guy's name on the disc. He had no idea that that information was on that disc because he was not computer literate. The cops arrested him and found him. And you just got to watch documentaries on the BTK killer because he was a guy that was married, had children, who was a normal member of the community. Actually, right? he was and very involved in the community, wasn't he? He was correct, and he worked, yeah. and he worked in the church, and yeah. he worked in the church. So, <laughs> I'm telling you, expect the unexpected, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of unexpected stuffs coming up in the Avery and Dassey cases. Like, you look at the BTK killer and also other killers, and you think to yourself, "Here's a person that could be your next door neighbor that people describe normal." a loving husband, a loving father with children, and he went to church and he had a high position in the local church. So the metadata proved where the disc had come from. Guys, these guys who are looking at the uh, DASI computer disc, they can determine where it came from, the name of the computer, where it was registered, everything, right? There are no secrets, guys, right? All right. <laughs> Shall we continue with our reading, guys, unless anyone's got some questions in chat? I knew it was going to be controversial. Uh, we continue our reading? Yes, yes, we do. Awesome. No, uh, yeah. I was just like, Kelly was uh, talking about something that I didn't understand where is she coming from. 
And it turns out that she does have some information that she cannot share. So I understand that, which actually explains why we're kind of talking two different languages. And I don't want anybody to get frustrated because if we don't know something, let's say that Kelly does, then we can't discuss it on the even pain, oh, no. right? No. Yeah. So no. okay, okay. So I understand it now. But um, correct. Yeah. Okay. So forgive me. We were on. We had finished where it said searches for violent pornography to Bobby. And that's page. Um... Ten. It's on page 10. Okay. Continuing. On November 13, 2017, Zellner met with Buting and Strang to get their reaction. Attorney Buting states that neither the CD nor the Valley Final Investigative Report were ever disclosed to trial defense counsel. Attorney Buting points out that the CD was never logged into evidence but instead special agent Fassbender kept the CD in his possession. This explains why trial defense counsel never saw the CD when they re reviewed all of the evidence in the case at the Calumet County Sheriff's Department. So for maybe because I'm a foreigner and English is my second language, or maybe, I don't know, computer is definitely not my forte, definitely. I was confused between DVDs and CDs. I definitely know the difference between them. But in this case, uh, the prosecution yep. disclosed they gave him the DVDs, but not the CDs. That correct? That's okay. correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, Finally, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, what they did, because a computer disk is so large and contains a lot of information, many gigabytes of data. They burn it onto DVDs. So they partition the information and burnt that information on seven DVDs. However, Veely wrote a report and he did computer searches and he summarized all of that information on the CD. Right? Yes. So the CD was an analysis of the seven DVDs. There we go. Yes. And, and, it, and, and, it, and just to add to that, it, it was created in something probably like uh, multiple PDF files that are easy to open by Adobe or, you know, other various programs that can open a PDF and boom, you've got everything, the various searches. It would be, I'm sure, to split up into categories that are easy and right at your fingertips. Correct. And uh, guys, if I could just interject. Now, we are very fortunate to have Bob in chat. Shane and others, please be respectful. Please. That's the only thing we ask. It's, we know this case is very emotive, emotional, uh, and uh, people get hot under the collar, but we're so proud to have, and we're lucky to have Bob in chat with us. Right, please don't disrespect Bob. Um, I I know people are frustrated, but show your respect, please. Um, you can still ask questions. Yes. Be yes, because be, be respectful. Um, please, please be respectful. You know, it's not easy. Um, Bob is a mother. Um, her son's in prison, and her brother's in prison. Right, it's not easy for Bob. Okay. <laughs> So please be respectful. Otherwise, um, we're going to have to take down your posts. And um, I don't, we don't want to do that, right? So please enjoy each other's company. Learn from the experience. Okay. Um, <laughs> Neverly, would you like to continue? Yes. Over the course of several months, Zellner reached out to one of the former special prosecutors who assisted Kratz in Avery's prosecution, Assistant Wisconsin Attorney General Tom Fallon. She inquired about missing CD starting on November 14, 2017, then on December 4, 2017, and finally again on March 20, 2018. So three times. Finally, there was a breakthrough. It came on April 17, 2018, so like a year and a half later. Attorney right. Fallon finally produced the CD, which contained 2,449 pages, Zellner said. 
on May 25, 2018, current post-conviction counsel filed a motion to supplement the record on appeal with the CD produced by attorney Fallon. Now, isn't that interesting, right? It basically took, right, Jack 61? Right, Alice? It took a long time for Zona to get access to that CD, right? Um, and as a consequence of that, after Tom Fallon gave, gave um, Kathleen Zona the CD, that's where all the analysis was done uh, and a summary of all the analysis was on that CD. But here's the question. Did Buting and Strang have access to that CD, yes or no? Jack61. They did not. They did not have access to that CD. No. Nope. But did they have access to the seven DVDs? They did. Uh, I, I'm, they I'm did. taking it. I'm taking it for granted that they had the program in case it's called in case E N C A S E 2.0, which is what really yeah. did uh, used to encrypt and copy or ghost that hard drive originally. And he did it with all of them with uh, correct. Bobby's computer, Stephen and uh, Teresa's. So I'm going to take correct. it for, I'm going to take it for granted that they had that program, but I, I don't know that for positive, but I think they did. Correct. But clearly, Strang and Butine did not do a deep dive analysis no. of those seven DVDs, correct? No. Correct. Okay. All right. So it took a long time uh, for Fallon to release that CD. And then that CD obviously got analyzed. And as you can see, uh, it nearly had two and a half thousand pages of information on that CD, right? But Strang and Butine did not have access to that information. Uh, back during the trial. All right. Um, Neverly, would you like to continue reading? Yes, boss. In turn, <laughs> <laughs> in turn, Gary Hunt, Zellner's computer expert, determined that Bobby Dassey's computer was manipulated by, some, by someone out to destroy and conceal data on the computer. But why would someone do that? Mr. Hunt, after his examination of the seven DVDs and the CD, made the following conclusions. Mr. Hunt detected eight periods in 2005 which are relevant to the murder of Teresa Holbach when computer records are missing and presumably deleted from the DASI computer on August 23rd to 26, August 28th to September 11, September 14 and 15. September 24 to October 22nd, October 23 and 24, October 26 to November 2nd, November 4th to 13, and November 15 to December 3rd. And here's what he extracted from Teresa's last day alive. So On October let, let, let's, let's just take note and remember what we discussed before, guys the importance to prove that it was only Bobby potentially uh, looking at this material or downloading this material. Right, guys? Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, shall I continue? Yeah. Yes, please. On October 31st, 2005, the DASI computer was used to access the internet at 6.05 a.m., 6.28 a.m., 6.31 a.m., 7 a.m., 9.33 a.m., 10.09 a.m., 1.08 p.m., and 1.51 p.m. Okay, okay. Now, guys, and if Bob is still in chat, what time did Brendan and Blaine go to school that morning on the 31st of October? Does anyone know? Does is Bob still in chat? What I can't remember. what time did Brendan, what time did Brendan and Blaine go to school? Didn't he catch the bus at like seven? God, I can't even remember. Remember, maybe someone in chat can remember because I can't. Does anyone remember? Well, let's what give her some time to Blaine? answer. Okay. So the question for Barb is. When did Blaine and uh, Brendan leave the house to catch the bus to go to school? 
Okay. Wasn't it like seven or seven fifteen a.m. that they they walked down to the? I thought I thought it was just after seven in the morning. Yeah, because I read uh, Blaine Dassey's uh, uh, testimony, and I think even Brendan made statements that they catch the bus and near where the um, post office boxes are. The mailboxes uh, at the end of the gravel road. Yeah, yeah. mailboxes are, uh, are just after seven in the morning. But if Bob's in chat. Um, if you can say uh, when uh, your two sons uh, took off from the home, um, I think Bob starts work at early in the morning. Uh, Kelly says seven twelve a.m. That's pretty close to what I remember as well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So technically, technically, anything found at six o five, six twenty eight, six thirty one, and seven. Potentially could not be just Bobby. Guys, do you agree? Agree. Agree. So the court, if the court is looking at this, they will remove any searches done when the other boys were home, correct? And that's fair enough. You guys agree? Agree. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So therefore, therefore, if Brendan and Blaine and Bob were out of the house uh, after seven. That means that search is done at 9.33, 10.09, 1.08, and 1.51 can only be Bobby Dassey, unless someone had come over. Correct? Guys, you agree? That's right. But if somebody came over and Bobby was sleeping in his room and the computer is in Bobby's room, they right. would need to go be comfortable to go in and look at porn while somebody's sleeping. And it's password uh, protected. And they must have a password. Yeah. They must have a password as well. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, Neverly, continue. Right. As for the CD that was previously withheld from Strang and Buting prior to Avery trial, it did not require any specialized software, according to Hunt. The CD turned out 2,632 internet keyword searches for the following terms body. 2,083 journal, one of, uh, I'm sorry, body, 2,083 journal, 106, gun, 75, rav, 74, myspace, 61, fire, 51, gas, 50, stab, 32, Cement, 23, bullet, 10, DNA, 3, bondage, 3, throw out, throat, 2, tires, 2, blood, 1. The CD contained 14,099 images recovered from the computer. The CD also contained 1,625 photos categorized as recovered pornography which means that these images had been deleted and then recovered. Okay. Okay. Uh, continue. Well, this one, this, <laughs> there's one question I want to ask the panel and people in chat. Now, this is important. You read out the terms body, journal, gun, rav, myspace, fire, gas, stab, cement, Bullet, DNA, bondage, throat, tires, blood. Which one of those search terms disturbs you the most or is curious to you? Um, Alice, which one of those search terms uh, concerns you or do any of them concern you? Alice. Um, a few of them, but I mean... <sighs> Body, in a sense, body, I mean, putting body into a computer, body could mean anything. I mean, they could have injured a part of their body, so they were looking up, you know, what part of that body part, you know, was it a muscle, a tendon, or, or whatever, so they would have to put the word body in the computer, you know. So it's, it's hard to, to specifically say what each of those words could mean because it could be multiple reasons i.e 
body, as I just said, could be one of them had an injury or something like that. Not necessarily that it was a gruesome body or how to cut a body or or whatever. You know, if you just put that word body in there, um, it just I I don't know. I mean, so it's, it's it's a, the word yeah. did start be, you know, why would they be looking at that? Why would that word come up? You know what I mean? But yes. as I say, there could be a reasonable explanation for why these certain words came up as well. It, there doesn't right. have to be a gruesome element to it. There doesn't have to be a murder element to it. You right. know, there doesn't right. have to be a dismemberment element to it, if, if you see what I mean, you know. So... Right. They could be very innocent things that they've looked up at, but because you're typing in how many times has the word body been used on this computer, oh, yeah. and it brings right. up a shitload, sure. you know what I mean? I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, uh, you can put in the word body in your computer search, and you'll bring up thousands of documents that have got the word body. So the important thing is this, guys. Uh, even though you have the word body, it's the context in which it was found that's crucial, right? So uh, a word body can be completely trivial and may not be important at all, right? Um, thank you, Alice. Uh, Jack61. I'm going to tell you the one that really stands out to me, cement. Cement. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Cause well, I mean, you give up, you, well, you give all the rest of that search there of those terms, and you could kind of add maybe a few things together if you wanted to speculate. I'm not saying anything necessarily happened. I'm just saying you could. But then when you add the term cement in and try to understand in real time what was going on at the time, uh, that one to me really kind of stands out. It's like, okay, did somebody – bury someone in cement i don't know I, i'm just thought it stood out to me for whatever reason that's my word yep cement. thank you jack 61 i uh, never any of those uh, search terms uh disturb you or raise yeah. your eyebrow rav yeah that's very interesting rav yeah, it's so specific and because of Teresa drove the rap Yes, correct. And but of course, a, you, know, there, you know, I don't know why would he, why would somebody look up that car? I don't know. It's very specific. Okay. Very, very interesting. All right. Yeah, I was, um, thing that raised my eyebrow was um, Rav. That's very interesting. And uh, bondage, right? Uh, any, any of those other terms could well be uh, nothing related to any crime or murder or anything like that so that's why even though those search terms are there they've got to be in the correct context that's crucial all right otherwise the court's going to laugh at you <laughs> if you bring up because i'm telling you right now if you search most of people's computers you're going to find words and stuff like that all over the place and it's got to have the correct context yeah that's context, crucial. context is yeah, context is everything. We we know that in so many of the various other instances uh, throughout the, the case. Yep, correct, correct. And uh, I can see there's a very lively discussion going on with Kelly uh, and others in the chat. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, what, what can we say? At least it's eliciting a lot of fruitful, hopefully cordial and respectful discussion. Fantastic. And Neville, would you like to continue? Sure. I don't know where we left off. Sorry. But you're at the very I bottom of that. that we're on page yeah. 13. Yeah, it started uh, A at the bottom okay. of page 12 and then a search. A the search first. of the MSN messages reveals communication between Bobby and various individuals who identified themselves as teenage girls in the age range of 14 to 15. Bobby identified himself as being a 19-year-old. The messages have explicit sexual content. Right. Obvious. Is, yeah. is, is anyone concerned about that or is this what 
um, young men and, and young girls. I'm a little bit concerned about the age of those girls, but is this normal, normal behavior, normal interactions? Jack 61. It, it's concerning. I mean, when I was that age, it, it, was, it would have been very concerning. You'd have probably got your ass beat. And I'm just being straight. You, you know, a 19 year old has really not in any, I mean, to, to talk to, you know, a 14 or 15 year old is a, in a normal course of the day, no big deal. But anything in a sexual context, absolutely not. They're not old enough. Sorry for a 19 year old. They're just not. Oh, that's, God. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, 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 gonna want. Yeah. That's my opinion. So. Yeah. I think yeah. that if you have, teenage boys, you have not one, but several conversations with them. When it comes to the girls, you explain among other things, not just the birds and the bees, you know, how that goes, but also about the laws and the consequences if something goes wrong, which it can. And sometimes something benign and totally innocent, like playful can go very, very wrong. And girls could turn it around and accuse the boy that, you know, that they yes. have been wronged in some way. And it happens. Don't, I'm not judging the girls or the boys. I'm just talking life. It has happened. So, yes. you, you know, so you talk about that. And if you're 18, you do not mess with anyone who's below 18, 18 and younger. Absolutely, you don't because there's horrible consequences for those 18 year old boys. Yes. Yes. And, um, I think Kel Kelly in chat will back me up, but, uh, I believe that the contents of those MSN messages have been released. Uh, does anybody on the panel know that? I think I've seen them somewhere. The MSN chats have been released. Um, has anyone seen them? I've no. seen a few. When Bobby said, meet me at some dark, horrible place, and it's going yeah. to be like a chainsaw, I'm the guy with the chainsaw or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Which and was Kelly all and bullshit. Kelly and chat says, what if I told you that cement and body times two has one person username connected to their name? And guess what? It's not Bobby. Do research, guys. Yeah. Yeah, 100% correct. Well, um, Kelly, why don't you come on the panel and we can, like, tell us what you know, because this is, like, frustrating. As I said, we're, like, talking about two different things. Yeah. We're going over the book and... Uh, she can't get I to mean, this I channel. Oh, she can't? Okay. No. Okay. Um, okay. But, but the other thing is that, you know, even though we're discussing all of this, um there are certain things that when we can't say right it's as simple as that um so what we're doing is we're presenting what now remember this book was written in 2018 right many years have gone by many filings have been done and rejected and so we're just showing you the chronology of these events uh, we're right? going over the book yeah we're going over the book correct these are not our thoughts this is what farak wrote uh, and this is what occurred, right? But um, I find that a little bit disturbing that Bobby was communicating in a sexualized manner with uh, young girls. Uh, I find that a little bit disturbing. Um, Alice, did you have a comment? Sorry about oh, that. No. Did you have a comment? No. All good? All good? Uh, Jack61, any additional comments? Just one, and we have to, as you just said, we're covering the book, but we're covering, you know, Brack wrote what he knew at the time. Yeah. And and we're four right. years later. We're four years past that now. And a lot of times, you know, for us, it's hard to remove ourselves from now to back then. And, you know, that's unfortunate, but, uh, yeah, that, that's just where we are. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And we appreciate um, the information that Ke Kelly's uh, talking about in chat. We really, really do. Um, but we, we can't delve into anything deeper, right? And so we're just saying be cautious, 
with the, the comments that you make and the statements that you make, uh, you've got a really deep dive into all this information that was found on the computer. Right? That's right. right, guys? That's right. That's all we're saying, right? Be careful, be cautious with what you say. You've got to really analyze that information. But to me, there's no doubt that there was a lot of very hardcore, disturbing pornographic material, which I don't think anyone in this panel or anyone in chat will consider to be normal. All human beings are curious. That's understandable. But I think when you have an obsession with particular types of material, uh, to me, that's a, to me as a parent, that will be of a concern. Uh, and I know it's sort of like um, cheeky for me to ask, but I'm curious whether Bob actually knew that there was this material on the computer. Right? I'm not alleging anything, but it'd be interesting if Bob, if she's still in chat, whether she was aware that this material was on the computer. You know, it as a parent, that that would disturb me. All right, uh, Neverly, would you like to continue? Yes, and I don't know how to explain this, but to me, you know, porn, there's all kinds of porn. Don't get me wrong, all kinds. And for a young boy or young man or those teenage boys, let's say, to look at porn, what's regular, define regular porn. And then somebody to look at this vile porn, there's a huge difference. And if there's repeated searches of the vile porn, there's a fucking problem. Let's yes. not be naive. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. I, I do agree. Obviously, Avery's murder trial may have turned out drastically different had Kratz and Fassbender turned over the defense to the defense all the contents related to Bobby Das's computer. Bobby's trial testimony about being asleep from 6.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. would have been impeached by the contents of the seven DVDs and one CD, which would have shown that he was awake and on the computer eight times in that time frame, Zellner said in July 2018. The vast quantities of child pornography and the violent images of young females being tortured, sexually assaulted, and mutilated on the DASI computer at times when only Bobby was home, in addition to his MSN sexually explicit conversations with 14 and 15 year, old, uh, 15 year olds as well as the word searches after the murder that indicate an interest in skeletons, dismemberment, knives through skin, fire, handcuffs, guns, bullets, and blood could have been utilized by trial defense counsel to impeach Bobby's credibility with the jury by illustration of his knowledge and preoccupation with unique details of the crime. Now, now, now guys, let's go around the panel. Very quickly, do you believe that this information back in 2007, not now, back in 2007, do you think it would have had an influence on the outcome of the trials for both Brendan and Stephen? I just need a yes or no. Alice. Yeah. Jack sixty one. Yes. Neverly. Yes. All right. So guys, if you're in chat and you're listening, just say yes or no whether you believe this information that was uncovered by Vieli would have had a potential outcome uh for the trials of Stephen and Brendan back in two thousand and seven. Okay. We're not, we're, we're not saying now in 2022, we're saying back then, whether it would have had a potential outcome in the trials. And if the answer is yes, that's a real fucking worry. Guys, do you agree? If your answer is yes, that's, that's huge. 
Yeah, look at all these yeses, yes. Yeah, that, that's absolutely huge. Because remember, we know there were two damaging star witnesses against Stephen. Does anyone want to mention who they were? Neville, you want to mention who they were? I'm sorry, what did you say? Who were the two damaging star witnesses for the state against Stephen that we know Bobby, of? Yes, Bobby and Scott. Bobby Dassey and Scott Tadich. Uh, that, that's tough. Yeah. That, that's yeah, tough. Very, yes. B.W. Haggy says, in 2007, it wouldn't have been, it, well, it wouldn't have made a difference. They still would have found a way to pin it on Stephen and Brandon. And I totally agree. They were like, pin the tail on the donkey. It was Stephen or and nobody else. We understand that. Poor Brandon got, you know, roped into all of this. However, it I think that the perspective, not just on the jury, but on everybody else in that county would have been totally different if this was all public. Oh, no doubt. Could you imagine? Could you imagine, guys, if Strang and Butin did a press conference and release the contents of the VLE CD. As that, a rebuttal, it would have been really damaging. We have to accept that. that. Not talking mm -hmm. about now, talking about in 2006 yeah. and seven. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's Correct. why Crash, that's why Crash buried it. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> when Crash does something, he does oh. it with fucking purpose, you know? He, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I'll tell you right now, the way Judge Angie danced around the Valley CD is one of the most shocking reports I have ever read. How the state just simply washed their hands of the entire Valley CD and just basically threw out uh, Kathleen Zellner's filing that there was no Brady violation. You just got to read it to believe it. Uh, Alice, uh, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, but, uh, just a, a, a few hellos and a few comments. Um, Crockett's joined us in chat. Hi, Crockett. Oh, welcome, Hi, Crockett. Magic Good to see you here. In chat. Ronald and Cher have also joined us in chat, and Colette Fantastic. as well. So, hello, lovely people. And Behind the Magic has got a good point as well. She, she says, yes, she thinks it would have changed things, but she also says, sorry, I had to add that they probably would have just added Bobby. So she, she's saying that they would have added Bobby and went after Bobby, Stephen, and probably Brendan. Possible. Yes, yes that, that is a possibility. But the problem is this, right? If you damage the credibility of Bobby Dassey as a witness, he's in trouble and the state's in trouble. Correct? Yeah. That's right. And as Dark Side, Dark Side says as well, and it's a good point, and we all know the answer, is what would they have done if they found it on Stephen's computer? If they oh. Yeah, if they'd have found all that information on Stephen's computer, Brendan wouldn't be where he is now because they would have had all the proof that they needed that Stephen was this vile, murderous, devious, rapist, whatever, and... The March 1st press conference wouldn't have been about Brendan. It would have been about Stephen. They'd had a parade. They would have had yeah, a parade, Al. Yeah. We, they, they, we know that all this would have been brought up in court and that as well because Kratz would have jumped on that factor. Everybody would have jumped on that factor if all this was found on Stephen's computer. Correct. And remember what we discussed last week. I think it was last week or the week before. We actually showed the newspaper clipping. <laughs> we actually showed the newspaper clipping of Wigert projecting and broadcasting what he expected to find on Stephen's computer. That's why they had the search warrant. Right, Jack 61? So Wigert had already fired the gun without doing any checking. That's right. So he was, he, he was doing pattern matching because this is a sexually motivated crime. This is a sexually motivated crime. So hence we would expect the suspect to have all this violent pornographic material on his computer. But fuck me. 
they found it on the star witnesses computer so they had to deep six it because had strang and Buting had that cd and had the analysis that would have impeached bobby i'm sorry bob that's the reality of it that would have impeached him to say are you a co-conspirator or are you the actual murderer right jack 61 right alice right neverly right yes. that information back in 2007 would have been extremely damaging because, yep. <laughs> because Bobby Dassey was watching Teresa Orbach through the window. So was he stalking her? And why would Bobby even bother looking at Teresa Orbach if he's getting ready to go hunting? Right, guys? What on earth is he watching a photographer taking pictures if he's ready to have a shower, a dress, go bow hunting? It and they'll even, lie about it. And he wouldn't have even entered in his mind, guys. Come on. And Bobby gave a description of Teresa's clothing better than what Stephen did. Right, guys? Yes. So he was definitely looking at her for at least five minutes. Because Stephen said she was there for about five minutes, came, parked the car, took some pictures. I walked up to her. We went to her car. She gave me a magazine. Gave her the money and she left. So you're correct, the guys in chat, you're absolutely 100% correct. If that material was available back in 2007, they could have said, Bobby, either you're the murderer or you're a co-conspirator, right? And that could, the state could have easily produced a story to rope in Bobby and Stephen as being the last people to see Teresa Horbach alive, but they didn't do that. They went after Stephen, exclusively Stephen, not Bobby, but suddenly Brendan came into the equation and completely destroyed everything. Right? So what we're trying to do is to make sense of what these computer searches mean whether they're relevant or totally irrelevant, X61. Yeah, I mean, their goal, clearly their goal was to end the depositions, which they did. That was the first thing. And the next thing was to settle that lawsuit in whatever capacity, which they did, because they that was really forced on Stephen because he had to have money to hire lawyers. Correct. Correct. So he was screwed no matter what. He was the goal, and everything else is collateral damage. Everything. Yep, hundred percent correct. Uh, Alice, do you have a comment? No, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that was still undone. Uh, no worries. All right, Neverly, uh, shall we continue? Sure. But during Avery's trial, Kratz lauded Bobby Dassey. He made sure Bobby was considered a brave impartial witness the jury could trust and believe just like cracks <laughs> i love this <laughs> that's an oxy that's an oxymoron right there trust <laughs> believe just like Kratz. Just that's like an oxymoron Kratz. right there yes. guys you need to put oh that God. on the t-shirt i know this was like a little silver lining of this doomy and gloomy topic but 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 you can now understand, guys, all jokes aside, I know I'm stopping Neverly. I do apologize. But now you could understand why someone like Brenda Schuller was so pissed off with um, Farak, right, and wrote that nasty email. Right, Jack61? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because Farak doesn't pull any punches. He says it as it is. And he's highlighting the important things that happen uh, during the trial that we've been discussing for years, right? And here it is, beautifully encapsulated all in one chapter. Uh, Neverly, would you like to continue? Yes. Can I read that passage again, please? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> but during Avery's trial, Kratz lauded Bobby Dalsey. He made sure Bobby was considered a brave in partial witness the jury could trust and believe just like Kratz. Boom. 
Yes. Yep. Again, a witness without any bias, Kratz told the jury during closing arguments. It's an individual that deserves to be given a lot of credit. Because sometime between 2.30 and 2.45, he sees Teresa Hallbach. He sees her taking photographs. He sees her finishing the photo shoot. And he sees her walking up towards Uncle Steve's trailer. Sweaty Boom. Uncle Steve's trailer. Boom. So, guys, yeah. now you know why Bobby became the star witness for the state. Because he actually was one of the only person, apart from Stephen, that saw Teresa Hallbach on the Avery Salvage Yard. I don't believe anybody else has reported seeing Teresa Hallbach on the Avery Salvage site, apart from Bobby and Stephen. Guys, is that true? Does That's anybody true. know of anybody else? No. Nope. And you would have thought she drove in. Yeah. You would have thought that Earl or maybe even Charles saw her drive in and drive out. You would think. I, well, I don't know. Well, <laughs> there's one person that really, really worries me a lot. Anyone want to have a guess? Chuck. Go for it. Chuck. Yeah. Ch Chuck Avery. Chuck Absolutely. Avery does. He worries me a lot. Yeah. But that's for another that's for another day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So quite clearly, guys, you can see that Bobby um he watched him he, he watched Teresa for the entire photo shoot. Right? And the reason why we know is because he saw her drive up, saw her take photos, and saw her walk towards his uncle's trailer. But he never said that he saw Stephen and Teresa together, ever. Because he said he hopped in his, he, I think he said that he hopped, then hopped in the shower, had a super quick shower, and then went bow hunting, right? All right. Uh, Neverly, would you like to continue? Sure. Buring and Strain both strongly assert that having access to the hidden CD that was kept from them by Kratz would have altered their defense strategy. I accept without challenge Ken Kratz's assertion in a January 25, 2007 email to me that Lily's analysis of Steve, Teresa's, and Brendan's computers yielded, quote, nothing much of evidentiary value. With the belated production of the Vili forensic analysis to Mr. Avery's current lawyers in April 2018, it now appears to me from materials that Ms. Zellner and counsel have filed that the Vili forensic analysis in fact did include much of evidentiary value in direct contradiction to Mr. Kratz's claim. Yeah, but guys, <clears throat> what's the obvious problem in that in that paragraph what's the big bullshit line in that paragraph that straight away you know is wrong what is it guys anyone nothing, picked it out nothing uh much of an evidentiary value thank you yeah that's one but there's one but there's one even worse anyone pick it up brendan's computer you got it okay brendan's computer now let's think about this guys you've got two trials going on stevens and brendan's independently look what kratz labeled it as an analysis of steve's Teresa's, and brendan's computer now if you're if you're straying and butying you'll be thinking well we're not calling up Brendan. He's not going to be a witness. Well, we just simply believe there's nothing of evidentiary value. He's a 16-year-old kid. What do we need to analyze what's on that computer if it's Brendan's computer? So, guys, can you see how mischievous Mr. Kratz was? Yes or no? Absolutely. Totally misleading. <laughs> Correct. So you've got two high-powered lawyers looking at this letter that Mr. Kratz had sent them, and they're going, what the hell do we want to know about Brendan's computer for, right? Had it been called the Dassey or the Yanda 
household computer. And Kratz gave a list of everyone who had access to it. Do you think Strang and Beauty would have gone, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, we want to know what's on this. Correct? Yes or no? I think so. And, in, you know, uh, the other flip side of that is uh, the, the Fassbender report about that computer and him knowing that this is the uh, the other real crux of the problem for me. I don't know about everyone else, but he had seen that uh, Bailey report, CD file report on May 11th, you know, er, er, right in around that time frame when they went after Brendan again. He had seen that and he knew what was on it and he didn't do anything. That, that's another real problem. And uh, that could yeah. even, I mean, for me, that could have even, they could have even questioned his integrity and in not doing some kind of investigation, even if nothing happened at all. Go fucking ask. Go, go to the, 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 these kids and say, what the hell is going on here, guys? I found all this shit on your computer. What's going on? He didn't even do that. Correct. But you know what is truly remarkable? Nothing much of evidentiary value. Guys, what the fuck? What did Kratz say? Absolutely. Kratz said that Stephen Avery had lured Teresa Horbach under false pretenses to the property. And B, it was a sexually motivated crime. C, Look at the forensic evidence of what happened to Teresa Horbach and what Brendan said. Rape, tied up to a bed, torture, shooting to the head, to the body. Stabbing. 10 or 11 times. Th throat cut. Throat cut, stabbed in the stomach. But she still didn't die. But she still didn't die. And then finally shot twice in the skull dismembered and cremated have a look at the bloody the, the material that they found on the dasi computer it's a pattern match torture rape mutilation the whole gamut and they had the gall to say nothing much of evidentiary value Guys, we should end the podcast right here. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> Absolutely, I, it's I, crazy. I am completely speak. It means it means that you can download all this shit, but it's fine. The state saying no problems at all. But right? he had a se he so, had a second he had a second motive, doc, and that was to keep Zilly off the stand. Remember, off the stand, hundred percent. 100% correct. And uh, let me tell you right now, uh, Neverly and I are working on the next chapter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't wait. I don't even want to do it. I don't even want to do it. And uh, to me, it's completely mind-blowing when you see the strategies done by the pros prosecuting attorneys and how they kept certain people off the stand because remember jack 61 alice and neverly uh, ken kratz had a whole page of stipulations and one of them was the cd analysis stipulation project stipulation project yep stipulation project stevens Teresa's, and brendan brendan's computer now brendan was in a separate trial of course they never called up brendan right so and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they not use anything on that computer against Brendan as well in Brendan's trial? Right? I don't think they mentioned anything about the VLE CD. No, I don't. If it came up, I think it may have came up maybe, I think I looked at this. I think it came up maybe twice, but it was a very generalized nothing. Minor. It was very minor. Yep. Yep. All, all, all it was was they played the interview the interrogation of Fassbender and Weget, except they didn't play the end, and then they used the phone call to the mother. That was it. Yeah. And this kid's in prison for life based on words. No forensic evidence. And you would think, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
if the state wanted to nail Brendan, they've got that computer. But there's one problem, the kid's at school, right? <laughs> so what the hell? It doesn't make any sense, guys. Um, Alice, did you have a comment? No, 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 I just realised that I was on mic there, so I put it back on. No worries. All right, guys, shall we continue for a little while longer? Yeah, we're all good? Yeah. Yeah. Chat's rocking and rolling. We've got a lot of people there. Fantastic. Yeah. And Neverly. Yeah. yeah, Neverly, would you like to, uh, Sorry, Alice, did you have a comment? No, 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 no. Just uh, I was just going to say that we're, we're looking fine in the chat now, so we're all good. Correct. Correct. Uh, Neverly, would you like to continue? Sure. Given what I know now about the existence and content of the Vili forensic analysis, this looks to me like deceit. It looks like deceit about who used this computer. It looks like deceit about the evidentiary value of the information extracted from the computer. At a minimum, it looks like material information bearing on innocence that the state knowingly possessed had ex exclusively and in its possession and withheld from the defense. Does as that sound Brady. like a Brady violation? Yep, as in Brady violation. Yep. What else did Strang point out in his summer 2018 affidavit? We should have used the information in the Vili forensic analysis to support our motion by strengthening our showing that Bobby Dassey was an alternate suspect. At the minimum, the information would have gone to Bobby Dassey's availability and opportunity to commit violent crimes against and kill Teresa Hallback on October 31st, 2005. To his sexual motive or other deviant motive to do so, and to the credibility of his alibi. We also would have sought to introduce evidence of incriminating internet searches that likely were made to, by Bobby Dassey and would have confronted him on cross-examination with those searches and other information contained in the Vili forensic analysis. I have a question. Mm -hmm. If the CD was, and DVDs were all together, given to the defense would kratz even put bobby dassey on the stand is my question yes he had to he, he had, had to. to he had to because bobby dassey is a material witness he's the only person on the salvage yard apart from stephen that saw the, the saw the victim right so he was the last person to see her potentially alive on the salvage yard but what the defense, sorry, what the state had to do was deep six the Veely CD to make sure that it was not analyzed by Strang and Buting. Otherwise, it would have been very embarrassing for Bobby and for the state. Because remember, correct me if I'm wrong, um, guys, but the jury wanted additional information from whose testimony again? Bobby. They wanted it read back, Bobby. all of it. Bobby Dassey's. They wanted information back from Bobby Dassey. Now, I'm telling you right now, yes or no, would the jury have raised an eyebrow on Bobby's credibility had that stuff come out in 2007? And the answer would obviously have to be yes, right? They would have thought, wait a minute. Here's a guy that's potentially searching all this torture porn, right? If they could prove it was Bobby. And he's looking at Teresa Horbach for at least five minutes. And then he has an alibi given by Scott Tadich, who is the other star witness for the state, who mentioned a great big whopping fire. That grew so, over three statements. Correct. That grew over three. You're correct, Neverly. So there's something weird going on. And not to mention the fact that Ramlo sees the RAV4 literally down the street from Scott Tadich's property at the turnaround. So when you factor all these things into account, 
look what the, the, the look what the, the look what the state did. They didn't provide the VLE CD because they had the report on there and all the analysis, right? And they called up Bobby Dassey um, to basically talk against his uncle, right? So they had to hide that information. Uh, otherwise, it would have been very embarrassing for Bobby and for the state. Jack 61. If we take this just one step further and uh, just as a little bit of a speculative analysis, and we think about if the Billy CD had come in for them to use as rebuttal, how would this have opened up other witnesses to have, to have been called to the stand? Because I think it most definitely would have uh, not only Blaine, but for anyone that had access to that computer, but probably would have been marched in and grilled, uh, I'm sure, in preliminary, right, in a preliminary hearing. But here's the other part of uh, this that uh, we've kind of overstepped here. And we'll, I want to make sure that you know people understand the timing. Uh, Fastbender, yes. Fastbender got that report, that CD from Vili on May 11th, 2006. Kraus did not turn any of that stuff over for seven months. And it was February, I mean, December of, of that year, seven months later, before they even got it. So he just sat on Correct. it. And they, and they dumped the seven CDs on him as well mm. a couple of weeks before trial as well, right? Seven DVDs were, and Jack 61, not even you can process seven DVDs for an <laughs> open no. mic podcast. No. No chance on hell. Not a, not a chance on hell, no. 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 So these guys, Strang and Buting, were preparing for a murder trial, right? And they were meant to somehow analyze seven DVDs worth of stuff when it was all done on the Vili CD. Nah, there's that's something, right. There's something not right here. Well, he did it. I'm he did sorry. it. He did it on purpose and with a reason. And that goes back yep. again to that stipulation project where he says nothing relevant on Brendan's computer. Well, the right. hell there, the hell there wasn't. Correct. 100% correct. All right. Uh, Neverly, shall we continue? Anthony Hill says, how would it have been if Brandon testified and recanted for Stephen? Well, that's why Kratz fought to try him separately. Correct. Because correct. that would, be a ma- it would have been a mess to quote yep. Mike Hallbach. <laughs> yep. Correct. Now you're being cheeky there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you're being cheeky. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that the the state had to make sure that Brendan never appeared in Stephen's trial because Brendan would have appeared on the stand, the defense would have ripped him apart, and Brendan would have recanted on the stand, and the whole thing would have blown up, right? It would have been a it would have been to use the word politely, a clusterfuck of monumental proportions. Right, guys? Disaster. Just an absolute it disaster. A, it would have been a disaster. So Ken Kratz, during the um, Brendan Dassey depositions, said, yeah, 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 we tried Stephen without using any of Brendan's statements. And Jack 61 is going to jump up and say, <laughs> what are you going to say, Jack 61? Uh- there would be no end to the things I would say, Doc, I'm telling you, because he, he used everything for almost a year. And then they said, oh, Correct. we can't use him in tr- at Brendan's trial. we got to pull everything out. Uh, correct. But all of a sudden, the hood lad swab and Ida Mifel just show up, right? <laughs> oh, boy. I'm telling you, this case is a real crazy one. All right. Um, would you like to continue reading, Neverly? Sure. It's highly probable that if Kratz and Fassbender didn't selectively choose to keep the computer analysis CD from building and strength, the trial would have had a different outcome. If Bobby Dassey's trial testimony was, um, pardon me, was shown to be a complete farce, it is very likely the jury wouldn't have returned a guilty verdict for Avery. Which is what we've concluded too. Yes. Mm-hmm. A lot of people in chat. 
Information demonstrating a probability that Bobby Dassey used that computer to gain access to the Internet on October 31st, 2005, during times that he claimed to be asleep, and while Brandon Dassey was known to be at school that day, also would have been used in cross-examination of Bobby Dassey at trial, had we known that information in the Detective Valley and Gary Hunt forensic analysis. I know that, in the end, the jury asked during the liberations for Bobby Dassey's testimony. And that's yes. what we said as well. Yeah. And then, but what yes. did the judge do? He said no. Th that's he correct. He did not but... allow them to go over that testimony. No, not, not in, in the detail that they wanted. But, but here's the problem, guys. See if you can answer this. What? Remember how Kratz... It was a, during an interview, I can't remember with who it was, where he said, so what if Bobby Dassey lied that he was uh, awake? Uh, well, if Bobby Dassey was awake, there's two problems. One, he could have had access to the computer, and it looks like he did. But what's the other important point he could remember? There's something crucial that happened on that day in the morning. And what was it? Uh, calling, not not calling Auto Trader. Yeah, but but who called the household? Teresa called the Dassey household. Teresa yeah. called the Dassey household. Left a message. That's right. Left a message. Right now, is it possible that Bobby actually heard the message? And hence knew that Teresa was actually coming on the premises because I don't know about you guys, but what an incredible coincidence that you think about it. Bobby Dassey gets up to go bow hunting and he's looking out the window and he sees Teresa Horbach. That is remarkable coincidences, right? And man, what would BB say? Man, what man, 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 yeah. And BB would say, uh, what would she say? How convenient. How convenient, yeah. How convenient. All right. So keep that in the back of your mind. Him lying about being asleep actually is quite significant when you think about it. All right. Um, uh, would you like to continue? Yes. No, Sorry, I'm Alan. Gonna say, uh, Alan, uh, Anthony Howes in chat is asking quite a good question. He says, what was stopping Strang calling Brendan as a witness legally? I don't think they were permitted to. I th There was some legal reason that they were not permitted to. Something about the right, of, Jackson, right of self incrimination. That's correct. Yeah, it, because he's a co accused. He's a co accused. He was charged for uh, all sorts of violent crimes against Teresa Horbach. So it would be in his self-interest to lie, right? In other words, he would go on the stand and say, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. You you don't think he's going to go on the stand and self-confess, right? He's going to say, I didn't do it. So the state were not allowed to, the state decided not to call Brendan as a witness and in turn the defence couldn't call Brendan in as well. I think there's there's a, there are legal reasons why they couldn't do it. So Brendan was tried in a separate case, in a separate scenario, by the same people that convicted Stephen in a different murder scenario. Jack 61. I still think that they pulled some legal shenanigans uh, with the introduction of Adam FL in the hood latch, because all of that was derived from statements coerced out of Brendan. So, you know, I think it was a huge um, missed opportunity. That's me. I'm not a lawyer. Yes. It's just my thought. Yep. I think legally the defense was not allowed to call Brendan. But again, I'm not, I'm not an attorney myself. I do not know because Strang and Buting would have said, in, it's just like the comment they made about the Dassey computer. They said, ah, don't worry about it. it. If there's nothing of evidentiary value, it, there's no problem. And we're not calling up Brendan. 
the, st the state isn't calling up Brendan. That was the end of the party. Yeah, they probably but didn't it, even dream that there was that it was actually Bobby. They no. didn't even dream. Yeah. And a no. very interesting comment from I don't recall. Welcome, I don't recall. Paul Capaldi asked one of Kratz's alter egos, if it was Brandon's computer, why didn't you use it against Brandon? The answer yeah. was crickets. Yeah, correct. Correct. Because Kratz would have known by timing wise that a lot of the searches were done when Brendan was at school. So it would have looked really embarrassing because then you'll say, all right, if it wasn't Brendan, which other brother uh, had done this? Who else was looking at this material? And if the word came back that it was Bobby, uh, it would have been potentially very embarrassing for the state. So they just left it off the shelf. Excellent question. All right, Neverly. I reckon we do, what, one or two more pages? Guys, is everyone happy with that? Let's see how it goes. There's 55 people in the chat. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're rocking and rolling. Yes. Doing a good job. In retrospect, one has to wonder whether Kratz and Fassbender intentionally withheld the CD from Avery's trial lawyers because they suspected Bobby was the killer and realized the case had already reached the point of no return. Damn right. Current post-conviction counsel's expert, Mr. Hunt's forensic examination of the seven DVDs revealed 128 violent images of young females being tortured, sexually assaulted, and mutilated, Zellner said. There were dozens of images depicting young females in pain because of having objects and fists forced into their vaginas. The images also depicted dismembered, decapitated, and drowned bodies of young females. Many of the female images, both alive and deceased, bear an uncanny resemblance to Miss Halbach. Very yes, disturbing. That's, Very that's disturbing. extremely disturbing. Yes. Correct. Two pictures were found in an unallocated space, the first showing Miss Halbach and Mr. Avery, the second showing only Miss Halbach. The pictures were in an unallocated space because someone had deleted them. There is no way to know when these images were acquired or deleted. Therefore, prior counsel was deprived of a complete compilation of all the violent images, word searches, timelines, messages, and recovered images that had been deleted during the Halbach murder investigation. The state's forensic examiner was also suppressed. All of this material could have been used to establish Bobby as a third-party Danny suspect. Well, this was the problem, right, guys? This was the problem. The stipulation project was to ensure that Veerly never took the stand, right? Absolutely. Guys, can, Absolutely. You, can you imagine if the defense called Veerly and said, can you please give us a rundown of what you found on that computer? Oh, my as well God. As images that you found? Oh, my God. And I would have said, the defense would have said, um, Mr. Veely, whose computer did you find that material on? And if he said in the Dassey household and they asked which bedroom or which room was that computer in? And they said, Bobby Dassey. Man, the place would have been a riot. It would have, there would have been a riot. So look what, look what Kratz did. Right? Look what he, he, he made sure that Veely never appeared on the stand. And he didn't give the defense the Veely CD with the analysis on it. <laughs> and that's not a Brady violation, according to Judge Angie. It's not. Sane. Just, guys, just out of curiosity, you got to read the report written by Judge Angie, which I did the other day. It will blow your mind how Judge Angie said it wasn't a Brady violation. It was the fault of Strang and Buting for not analyzing the seven DVDs in detail. The judge blamed the attorneys. It's and their for fault. trusting the prosecution too and for trusting yes. and for trusting Kratz yes and for trusting and believing guys I've never heard such crap in my life they're saying 
it's your fault. It's like someone gives you, if someone gives you a, a cake or something like that and says, oh, look, I promise that this is a no sugar cake. Promise. You eat it, you get a diabetic attack. And then the doctor blames you for trusting the person who gave you that thing. So Judge Angie was able to toss out the the filing by Zellner by saying, this is a Brady violation, guys, by saying, no, nah, it's the fault of Australian Beauty. They had the DVDs. It's their tough luck that they didn't analyze the DVDs. Jack 61, can you believe this? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, it's one thing for uh, in the adversarial process for, you know, the uh, prosecution and, and defense to have uh, a war of words at trial, but to yes. uh, for a prosecutor to intentionally mislead um, trial attorney, the, the, the defense, I, I don't see how that's not a violation. Uh, there's a, I can't remember the exact, I, I don't know the statute or whatever, but there's a, a, a statute uh, about uh, uh, or defense lawyers having to seek and find yeah. information, right? That should have been information that should have been handed over immediately. And he didn't do it on purpose. And for some reason, Judge Angie thinks it's fine for him to uh, trick the, the defense. I'm sorry. I, I have a real problem with that. Real problem. Yeah, yeah but... Judge Angie blamed Strang and Buting. You know what she said? Listen to this, guys. She said, if Strang and Buting were so concerned with, with not having enough time to analyse the DVDs, they could have written to the court to ask for an extension. <laughs> well, to me, this was such a hard lesson to learn, but I think they did have to learn it. Because as yoga for the ageless says, you know I'm a liar and you believe me. Yes. That was a very hard lesson, like rude awakening. You and know, you so just, all the gentleman gentleman agreements, you know, yep. stipulations, yep. handshakes and whatever. Sometimes that works on, uh, among decent people, but we're talking about rats. Correct. And, yes. Correct. So you now, they now discovered the lack of ethics by Kratz. They now discovered how he worked, right? So just before the trial, they dumped the seven DVDs on him, right? And expect them to analyze it after Kratz said in a stipulation, there was nothing of evidentiary value on Brendan's computer. That's how the game worked. And Zilna said, hey, this is a Brady violation. And Judge Angie threw it out and said, tough, tough titties, too bad. You're out and threw it out. So now they can't even, like, they now can't even produce, they can't even say, hey, there's a Brady violation right there. Nope, the judge tossed it out. And Delivery. moreover, they said, just because he likes Porn does not mean that he's not credible, that he's a liar. They said something, I'm paraphrasing, of course. And I'm like, what? He right. lied through his teeth to begin with. And But you see how they will do anything, to, just like it would be inexplicable, right? Yes. How they gave up, they find the answer for everything. Correct. And correct. <laughs> Which is very interesting because... Uh, all the porn bots are, are working overtime, guys. So they must be listening to our search to our terms. <laughs> Boom. Maybe right. I should go uh, to church tomorrow. Yeah. Correct. And, and nobody would like to continue. Yes. But couldn't the prosecution come back and say, hey, wait a minute. There were four boys living under the Dassey roof. Here we go. Isn't it possible any one of them was the deviant pervert constantly viewing this dirty, disgusting smut that was messing with their mind? When Zellner, uh -huh. when Zellner's expert utilized his 2017 computer forensic tracking software on the computer, Hunt uncovered a total of 667 internet searches for sexual images 
quote, on weekdays when Bobby was the only member of his family at home during the week from 6.30 a.m. to 3.45 p.m. All other Dassey family members who lived at the residence were either at work or school during those hours, end of quote. That's, that's, that's what, what we were talking for an hour, yeah. Yep, that's what you have to show, 100% yeah. correct. Prior to Teresa's disappearance, Barb and her husband, Tom Yanda, had split up and he was no longer staying on Avery Road. According to Barb, Tom Yanda moved out before October 15, 2005 and never looked at pornography on the Dassey computer. Bobby was the only person at the Dassey residence from 6 a.m. to 3.45 p.m. on the weekdays. During the week, Blaine and Brendan were in school until 3.45 p.m. Brian lived with his girlfriend and worked during the day. Barb also worked a day shift, and Tom Yanda no longer lived at the residence. And to, to be fair, to be fair, you probably have to extend it to seven, at least 7 o'clock, 7 a.m. Right, Jack61? Right, Alice? Right, Neverly? Because yeah. Blaine and, and Brendan were still probably having breakfast and still at home. Yeah, you have I, to, you only... I, I, they probably didn't leave till around five to seven or right around seven to walk down to the bus stop. Correct. Correct. And uh, I believe Blaine and Brendan shared a bedroom. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, I think so. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. McCrary, and this is the, oh, I'm sorry. Zeller also enlisted the expertise of retired FBI behavioral analyst Greg McCrary to weigh in on this matter. McCrary opines that these Dassey computer searches demonstrate the obsessively compulsive nature of Bobby Dassey's internet searches and the fascination with sexual acts that involve the infliction of pain, torture, and humiliation on females, and an equally disturbing fascination with viewing dead female bodies. Barb hired someone to reformat the Dassey computer prior to law enforcement seizing it. The reformatting resulted in a number of images being removed during the critical period before and after the murder. Did I skip some pages? No. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. But since Kratz was liable to say and spout out anything, couldn't the special prosecutor now pontificate this was all Stephen Avery's doing? Perhaps Avery was sneaking into his sister's trailer during the, during the daytime when she wasn't around to fill his mind with dirty and wicked fantasies that would drive him over the end and make him murder Teresa. And uh, this this is exactly this is exactly what um, Judge Angie would have done. This is exactly the line of thinking that the um, the prosecution team would have done. Uh, they would have tried to find any type of valid excuse for the material that was on the DASI computer. They would never admit that the searches, some of the searches were done by Bobby DASI, ever. They'll try and find some type of um, reason, excuse to um, somehow deflect from a Bobby and point a, a finger at Stephen Avery, despite the fact that Stephen had his own computer in his trailer, right? So the questions that are being asked here are legitimate ones, 100% correct. The state attempted to convince the jury that Mr. Avery's motive in setting up the appointment with Ms. Holbach on October 31st, 2005, was to lure her to her property to sexually assault her, Zellner said. During the searches of the Avery property, the state focused on trying to gather pornography from Mr. Avery's residence. However, a forensic analyst performed by the state's examiner of Mr. Avery's computer in 2006 revealed no searches of sexual images, much less violent images and dead bodies. Mr. That's Avery, significant. Yes, yes. That's significant. Mr. Mr. Avery never access the DASI computer. He did not have the password for the computer, nor did he possess a key to the DASI residence, which was locked when no one was home. Mr. Avery only entered the residence with permission or a DASI family member. Furthermore, 
Avery would be eliminated as being the deviant culprit on all but 15 of the 128 computer searches just by the fact that he was thrown in jail on November 9, 2005. Okay. Brandon would be eliminated from all by 26, but 26 of the 128 searches at issue by having been arrested on March 1st, 2006. So the significance of that is you can't completely rule out Brendan, you can't completely rule out Stephen, but the amount of searches that they could have done is only a small fraction of the searches done in total. Guys, do you agree? Agree. And that's the damaging part. Uh, the fact that you can't totally eliminate, eliminate Stephen or Brendan, but if they did do searches, it's only a small amount, right? So somebody else was doing the majority of those searches. Correct. Yes, Neville, you can continue reading. Yes. I think we're done. We are done. That's, um, the, last, that's the last page. Yeah, that's the last page. Unbelievable. We've, we've actually finished the chapter. And um, this to me, if I could just make the comment, this to me is a really big worry because um, I'll read it out. Uh, former FBI stalwart uh, Greg McCurry maintains that a competent group of police investigators would have considered Bobby Dassey a prime suspect in the death of Teresa Horbach. Now, guys, this is someone with a hell of a lot of experience, right? Um, and if he's coming up with something like this uh, and the state completely ignored it, guys, to me, that represents a huge, huge problem. Exactly, Dr. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Neverly. Exactly, Dr. Silkman. You don't have to be the FBI psychological sexual deviant profiler to See that there's a problem with Bobby Dassey and his searches and whatever. Any of us could have concluded that, I believe. Correct, hundred percent correct. Now, um, you, that's the last slide. And for those who want to do further research, uh, there's a couple of more slides with the uh, references and footnotes, uh, because what happens is that. Um, John Farrakh puts the footnotes at the end of the chapter. And so if you want to do any further reading, uh, probably in our website and in our library, you'll find those documents as well. But um, trust me, um, McCrary is no lightweight. He's got a lot of experience. And if he's looking at this material and saying, hey, at the very least, he should have been considered a suspect, it didn't happen. Jack, Jack 61, do you have any comments? Oh, he definitely should have been considered a suspect and looked at. And as I said earlier, once Fassbender got that CD on May 11th, 2006, questions should have been asked. This guy was uh, uh, on a um, task force for Internet, whatever, uh, about, uh, you know, sexual things and that, that kind of stuff. Questions should have been asked, and they weren't. Uh, th that's correct. And in actual fact, that's a travesty, right? Because Fassbender would have looked at this material, would have read the report and said, hey, look, there's something going on here. At the very least, admit that there was something nefarious going on in that household. What were these young men, young boys, whatever, looking at this stuff? Now, wait a minute. If the state's whole case against Stephen is that it's a sexually motivated crime, correct? Sexually motivated. And Jack61 did the open mics. And he'll, te he'll tell you the line of questioning that Fassman and we get said to um, Jody was all sexually motivated. Absolutely. How was your sex what did you do? How many times did you have sex? Did Stephen do this? Did Stephen do that? They were trying to pattern match and to get Jody to admit things. Lo and behold, the very things that they were asking and feared were not on Stephen's computer. No. 
but it was on the star witnesses computer and they totally didn't want to discuss it and they deep six that uh jack 61 yeah, you know some of the questions uh and during that september 13th 2006 interview uh, they, they were talking about or maybe it wasn't nothing but it was one of them you know uh, you, you guys would have sex multiple times per day and You'd get sore and complain, but he would want to make you do it anyway to force you. It is gross as shit. And you know, and she's like, No, if I told him, he would stop. He didn't didn't try to hurt me. If I asked him to stop, he would. It was, and she had to tell him that numerous times. She did a good job. He did. Under all the pressure. Well, yeah, but you know, because uh, the uh, February 15th, 2006, they played phone calls between. Debbie and uh, Stephen to piss her off. And then, you know, she sent the, the uh, uh, I think it was the 20th of, no, I'm sorry. Fassbender or Weger had, I think, another interview with her on the 20th. And then there was more contact. And then she finally sent a note to Dettering. is like, I don't have any more contact with you. Don't, don't follow me anymore. And that went, as far as we know, until August uh, she, of course, she was out by then until August of uh, 2006. And they, you know, contact resumed because she she wanted um, some of her stuff back that got, that got eased. And so we took that opportunity once again to bring her in, play phone calls, read letters between Stephen and, and uh, Debbie to piss her off even further again to try to prompt her to turn on Stephen. And she wouldn't do it. She was pissed at him. I think... You know, we've talked about it. I, I think that uh, she loved him. I think he loved her. But they drove that they drove that wedge hard. It's clear to yes. see. Absolutely. Yes, and deliberately too. Hundred percent deliberately too, because they targeted Jody because they saw her as a very vulnerable person, uh, and to get Stephen isolated, have no friends, have no confidants. Have no one to speak for him, right? And all these veiled threats, right? Because the state couldn't work out a motive, right? The state couldn't work out why on earth would Stephen commit this crime literally in his house, broad bloody daylight with his brothers going around, his mother on a bloody golf cart could come in at any time, his nephews next door, the public... Right? And no one heard a thing. No one heard a thing except Brendan, right? When he said, oh, yeah, I rode my bike and I went to get the mail. When he walked straight past the mailboxes where he could have got the mail at 3.45 when they let him. The defense would have destroyed Brendan and his credibility. And Brendan would have said, yep, I recant. It's complete garbage when you think about it. And to add and to that. that and to add to that. He had this money that was fixing to come in. The depositions were definitely going his way. There was no doubt. They didn't want that shit at trial. So, yeah, it, it, they had to push really hard the other direction, and they did. They had to invent a narrative. They had to invent a narrative. And what's so ridiculous is that their own crime scene investigators would have told them, sorry, boys, Nothing happened here and nothing happened there. They t- Look what happened. We saw it on Ma'am when Jody went back to the house. The entire house was in an uproar. Everything thrown, strewn about absolutely everywhere. And she couldn't find her purse, right? So they tore the place apart. They were looking for anything. They swabbed everywhere. I believe, I'm not 100% sure whether they luminol treated the bedroom but they tore up the carpet, they tore up the wood paneling, they looked at the bed heads, the mat, nothing. How on earth do you commit such a violent, violent crime on another human being, two of them, and not find a trace? There's something not right. The crime scene investigators would have said, guys, if anything happened in here, we have no evidence of it in the trailer and in the garage, right? Brendan's recollections are all wrong. He even got the orientation of the bedroom wrong. 
right? Fassbender and Wiggins should have said, stop right there, go to your mum. It's bullshit, right? And that's why it's so in, infuriating when people say, yeah, yeah, they're guilty. But nothing backs it up. Nothing backs it up. These two guys, have, they're not, they don't have university degrees in forensic analysis or forensic science, yet they were able to espunge a violent, violent crime, wait, including dismemberment, including dismemberment. There's not a drop of blood anywhere. <laughs> Never leave. How do yeah. they do it? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's Wisconsin that happens, and you know, Avery Salvage Yard magic happens as well. But I wanted to remind uh, do you guys remember when Jody eventually retained an attorney and they, she went in to talk to Fassbender and Wiegert? Yes. And do you recall the master fuckery that Kratz did? He yes. pulled one of his tricks when he said, Oh, I'll give you full immunity. Full immunity for what? She wasn't even there on the right. 31st. I could not oh believe my God. when that lawyer said that, Neverly, I could not believe. I'm like, okay. why? For what? But right. it sounds good, right? But, guys, I found the emails that Kratz sent to the attorney, yeah. and there were veiled threats saying, who's retaining you and who's paying you? This, this Kratz... To the That's attorney right. representing Jody. That's right. Right? So Kratz was threatening the attorney. Right? So they had all heart. they basically did not want any representation for any of the Dassies or the Averys. They wanted them on their own. Vulnerable. Well, that's how Kratz operates. It's all about threats. He did the same thing to the victims of domestic violence. Correct. In a, I got you now. You'll never see your kids and blah, 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 whatever else he said to them. That's how That's he right. operates. Yeah. And not, a, not only that, Emily, he Bullying. emailed or phoned Kaczynski and told him it's unethical for you to talk to the press. Remember Jack 61? That's right. Oh, <laughs> my. Says, Don't talk to the press. And what did that fucker do? On the press conference, boom. So yes. he's telling wow. everybody else to shut the fuck up and he's talking out of his ass and spewing all this bullshit without any fact checking. None. None. But not only that, Doc. I mean, if, if, he's, if he's got the balls to turn around and say that to an actual lawyer... Yeah. Can you imagine what he's told Weigert and Fassbender and all the rest of them today to the rest of the family? You okay. know what I mean? Threaten them with anything? You know what I mean? Yep. I mean, was 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 cannabis legal in Wisconsin in two thousand and five? You know, know what I mean? If it wasn't, and Barb's got a charge for cannabis, you know what I mean? They could have held that over her. They could have held anything over the, 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 the family. They could have said to Brendan, well, it's either your brothers or your mother or, or whatever. They could have said to Barb, well, it's either Stephen or your boys. You know what I mean? They could have said to um, Brendan and um, Bobby and Blaine and Brian, well, it's either Stephen or it's your mum or it's your brother. You know what I mean? If he's got the balls to do that with a lawyer and say, remember who's paying your fucking wages, boy yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Guaranteed yeah. that they pull their dirty tricks with every single one of the family. And you've got to remember, they took Matt and Pa's fucking DNA. You know what I mean? But they didn't take Ryan Halligas or Blowdown or fucking any of the other ones that were closer to Teresa. Right. But they right. took Matt right. and Pa's. <laughs> The ones that wouldn't have been able to do fucking nothing because they were too old. You know what I mean? And that's no disrespect to them because I loved my, right. I loved my, uh, you know what I mean? God, God rest right. her soul. And then, I mean, Col then Colhane had the, the gumption to eliminate Ma Avery as leaving her DNA on the handcuffs and leg irons. 
Exactly, Doc. Exactly. <laughs> the, the, the fucking disrespect there. You know what I mean? But yet, yeah. they didn't do that with Ryan. They didn't take their fingerprints. They didn't take their DNA. And he was an ex-boyfriend who had problems with Teresa because you've got to remember, she cancelled going to a wedding, taking photos at a wedding because he was going to be there. You know what yeah. I mean? So... <laughs> It's just nonsense. It is absolute nonsense what they've what they've done. And if he's got the balls to do that to a lawyer, then you're damned yep. to it. And he's got the oh, balls yeah. to do that to members of the family. Yep, yep. So hold all of those thoughts, guys, because we've got a treat for you next week in the next week's chapter. Um, all I can say is um, if you haven't seen it, I'm not sure whether Neville has seen it or not, or anybody else. Check out Mind Hunters on Netflix. Oh, oh my God, I love that. I have seen yet. it? Yeah, it's a yeah. great show. It's a great show. Great show. Watch it before you listen to the next week's podcast because it's highly, highly relevant. And hopefully uh, I can get to read a book in between, in between the time. But... Um, Oh boy, next week's podcast. If you thought this was volatile, next week is going to be a ripper, right? This is when our FBI profilers are profiling all this material as into uh, people that have possible motives if this was a sexually a violent crime, right? So <laughs> check out and <laughs> see. Every, t- <laughs> every time we talk about sex, <laughs> the sex bots come on. <laughs> I tell you. All right, guys. Well, look. Just curious, Doc. Uh, what, what, which, what, what, what book are you going to read? It's read. Um, let's have a look. I could actually tell you. I could tell you the title of it. Um, give me a sec. It's one of the um, one of the authors. Um, that Kathleen Zilner actually has used uh, in an affidavit, I wrote a book uh, called Sexual Homicide, Patterns and Motives. Interesting. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can download it and read it uh, before next week's podcast because I just saw the series of Mindhunters uh, in which there were FBI pro... They're the ones that started it. Yes. They're the ones that actually... Started the profiling of a uh, serial uh, killers uh, that had sexually motivated crimes, including BTK, uh, Ed Kumpfer, I think the co-ed killer, uh, and uh, a whole other, whole other strew of other serial killers, and what they had in common, and what their motivations were, and it sort of like opened my mind that. No one had ever done it before. And this group, this group of FBI um, uh, employees decided to get together uh, with a, a forensic psychologist and they started um, coming up together uh, with a, a protocol. And they interviewed all the serial killers, including Manson as well. So if you haven't seen it, check it out because... Uh, Obviously, this author here co-wrote a book into what motivates and what's common in people that commit these uh, violent sexual homicides. And the state is saying that the murder of Teresa was a, a sexual homicide, right? And the question is, would Stephen commit such an act? Would Brendan commit such an act, right? Because that's what the state is saying, that it was sexually motivated. Remember what Fallon said? Brendan did it because he wanted to know what it was like. Right? So, hence, it is a sexually motivated crime. And you think to yourself, would these two guys really commit um, such a violent, violent crime uh, or not? But <laughs> stay tuned for next week. And Evelyn and I are still working on the chapter. Um, we have... We haven't finished it yet, but if you've got time, guys, in chat, check out Mine Hunters. 
on Netflix. Highly recommend it. All right, guys. Well, look, I'd like to thank uh, everyone in chat um, for all your excellent questions. I know that it got a very heated debate, and I know that people are very passionate, um, and that's understandable. Uh, just please be respectful of others. Otherwise, certain people won't appear anymore, and you don't want that, right? It's great that we can attract um, these people to the channel, and uh, especially Barb. Barb is in a horrible, horrible position, no matter no matter the outcome, no matter what happens. All right, guys, and I'd like to thank my panel members, and we'll quickly just go around the uh, the panel uh, and just a couple of closing statements. Uh, Jack61. Yeah, just to echo briefly what you were talking about uh, with uh, whoever joins the channel, uh, it's it's better to have the debate in a civil matter even if you disagree right. with that person, even if they're a guilter, if you can remain civil and have the conversation, you're better off. Because if you you know you get mad, it's polarizing. You get pissed off, you're upset, and you go ballistic on them. You can't talk to you. Can't access that information anymore. You can't. They're gone, and they won't come back. So so now you're right. just left with talking to. Well, I tried to talk to. Them. Well, no, you didn't try to talk to them. You yelled at them and, and whatever. Try to remove some of that emotion and ask the real questions. Be civil. With that said, um, yeah, it's been a, I really enjoyed this chapter and uh, looking forward to next week. And for tomorrow, oh, oh, oh. yeah, for tomorrow, we're going to be heading back to, it's open mic 99, and we're going to be heading back to the depositions for Deb Strauss, part two. Um, oh, juicy. Yep. And uh, Big Jeff, was, I think, is going to try to join us. In the chat. Oh, nice. Yeah, and maybe Jeff Jones too. I've been I've talked to them a little bit. You know, of course, it's an open mic. Anyone's invited. It's an open thing, and uh, you know, we'll we'll read it. I think that's her. her just is about. Um, I think it's about 150 pages. So we'll do what we can. Try not to keep everybody all night. If we don't finish, then we'll do another one and finish it later. So that's where we're headed, nice. and um, still working on. My prior uh, open records request, it's not fulfilled, but as we talked about, Amanda Bunnell apparently has left or left uh, the, uh, that position that she was in. There's a new person there, and uh, I don't know. It just seems to me like they've got a damn mess going on, so I haven't gotten any replies from um, beyond. She told me it's going to be a 10-day wait, and I'm like, well, this has already been approved. I don't. Why, why am I having to wait 10 more days? get a reply on something you guys screwed up. Anyway, we'll report That's more on that. Is, yeah, it is annoying. So hopefully sometime next week we can get some answers. So anyway, that's yes. where we're at, Doc. Thanks. Cool. And thank, thank thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks everybody in chat for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack61. Uh, Neverly, do you have any uh, comments? Uh, all is well. Um, there's been, this, it's so draining this whole subject nobody wants to think that the family had anything to do with this and that's the that's the infuriating part we're just reading the book but then you know emotions kick in and uh, who in this world would love to prove that it was bobby or anybody from on the desk itself? nobody nobody we want some you know i personally would love to think that this was an accident and that law enforcement took advantage of the situation you know what i mean i i would like to move on from and bobby and tadich i would like to really maybe something find something refreshing something new something more plausible i don't know that's how i feel about it you know going back to the zippers oh my god you know and that's a rabbit hole all in all but yeah it may it's certainly not a dull moment in this case, no. and it's fun to, to be no. on the panel and to talk about it. And, you know, we're all different. We come from cultural, we have cultural differences, different uh, life experiences. You know, we all have traumas from, you know, life or whatnot. And that all plays, I think, the part of how we, we react to certain things. So it's all um, understandable. However, let's be cool and not 
you know, be personal. Correct. 100% correct. Uh, these are the Dassey and Avery cases are some of the most heartbreaking cases of it I've ever seen and dealt with. I know there are many others. We've looked at those as well. But uh, this is on another level. This is on another level because of all the past history that law enforcement have had with Stephen. Uh, and also when you factor in Gregory Allen as well in the background, there's a lot of shenanigans going on. What I really like about Farak's book is that it brings everything together. And it brings the discussion together really, really nicely. Uh, and again, guys, don't just rely on the chapters or the books. Do your own research as well. Come up with the questions and we'll try and answer them at the same time. Thank you so much, Neverly. Excellent job with the reading, by the way. Thank you. Excellent job. Um, Alice, do you have um, uh, any uh, final comments? Yeah, just the, the, this case is full of major fuckery uh, every which way. Um, and all we hope for is for the truth to come out to set the boys free. Um, we have to follow where that goes. We can have our speculations, our opinions and everything like that. But to constantly go after the family, especially when they're having the courage to come in to chats like this um, yes. and be hounded constantly. As we say, it's all right to ask questions, but you've got to remember it's how you say it, not what you say. Um, so ask the proper questions and you'll get an answer. I mean, Barb was in the chat fine there. She was happily answering questions, but then she disappeared. And I don't blame her for that. I really don't. Um, we just have to make a point of saying everybody's welcome, yeah, but be respectful and do not hound Barb if she's in the chat because you're not going to get the answers that you want. She's just going to leave. And where does that leave you? You know what I mean? So be respectful of that. Um, you're, you're getting, yeah, you're getting an insight that very few people get. Yeah, and yeah. None of, us, none of us directly message Bob all the time, right? No. And that goes to show how we leave the family alone. Yeah. None of us. None of us are in constant chat with Bob. We've got a million and one questions, but we understand the sensitive nature and the privacy. Yeah, yeah, so when, exactly. When Bob and comes in. Yeah, and everybody's entitled to that. You know what I mean? So um, I, I, I just I had to say that um, because if, it, it's not just that. If there's somebody in our chat, who's constantly hounding and hounding and hounding somebody in the chat, no matter who it is, you know what I mean? It doesn't look good for us because we're allowing it to happen, you know? So, yeah, right. people did get put on a timeout and things like that, but that's what happens when you're, not disres when you're disrespectful or you're not being respectful or you're hounding, you know? So you've got to remember what goes on in chat affects us as well. So yes. we try and be fair. We try and let people who don't agree with what we agree with come into the chat and, and be involved. That's what Correct. we want. But we're not Correct. going to let bullying, because that's what it is, it's bullying, we're not going to let that go because that looks bad on us and and we're a team, so it falls back on all of us. You know what I mean? falls right. back on the people in the chat and that as well, especially, you know, if things go sideways. So. Um, that's all yeah. I'm going to say that um, a little bit of movement um, well I don't know if it's quite movement yet but it's heading that way um, and Luke's case uh, they are appealing to the SCRC which is the Scottish Criminal Review Commission there is 122 items in Luke's case, that has not been tested for DNA. Wow. Has not been tested wow. for DNA. Wow. So they're going to put in an appeal 
Um, I'm I'm not sure on time, states, or whatever. It's just in commu uh, communication. And there was an article on it the other day there uh, from Scott Forbes, who's the uh, one of the lawyers that works on the case. Um, they're asking for these items to be able to be tested. Um, which if the if Police Scotland, because that's what they are now, because they've all it used to be Lothian and Borders Police, but they've all amalgamated into one, so it's Police Scotland now for Edinburgh, Glasgow sort of thing. So Police Scotland. If Police yes. Scotland have got nothing to hide or anything like that and their case is so secure that yes. look is yes. the one that's done it, why did these hundred and twenty two items not get tested then? And yes. They should have no problem in getting them tested now. <laughs> you, you know. So you know, when I find it, that more, that. yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I've I've read Scott's book, um, like a long walk to justice. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, he can go into a wee bit more detail than what Sandra could. Um, yeah. Or certain things, you know. Um, so I would recommend that to uh, anybody. So as soon as nice. I know more on dates, um, things like that, or when the wheel is actually in motion, um, I shall uh, let people know. And uh, <laughs> and Ali William, <laughs> never mind, no, Ali <laughs> <laughs> William, it's happening. <laughs> so I'm going to keep everything crossed. Um, that they will say aye that these things can get tested and hopefully we'll get some answers so nice. fingers crossed yeah awesome well look guys if there are no more questions or no more uh comments um oh the book is called the book that i'm going to get is called sexual homicide patterns and motives and uh, if you go to amazon there's an uh ebook version uh, this hard book to get, but there's an ebook version. There's, I think, one of the authors is Burgess. There are two others. Um, I've only got part of the front cover, but if you go to Amazon, type that in, you'll get it. Um, what but, if an, or if there's an audible version, there could be, there could be, but uh, these three, um, uh, the Burgess has written a huge number of books. And is an expert uh, in this type of area of uh, crime. Uh, plus, there were two FBI profile profilers on there as well. Plus, Kathleen Zona employed her to write an affidavit, and also Burgess. So these are heavy hitters. These are heavy hitters in the industry. Uh, like I said, <laughs> you got to watch Mine Hunters. Although Mine Hunters is a dramatization. Uh, they, the FBI guys actually went in there and interviewed these serial killers, and it was the FBI, one of the, um, one of the profilers that actually came up with uh, the term serial killer, right? Because oh, yeah. They, they referred to them as sequential killers, but it didn't sound sexy enough, so one of them suggested serial killer. And I think one, I think one of the killers, one of the serial killers, actually left a bowl of cereal on in one of the crimes that he had committed. Left the bowl of cereal just to say, "Ha ha, I've got total control." And some of these guys, in especially BTK, absolute fruitcakes. But could be your next door neighbour. That's right. And he was. He was into Boy Scouts, and he held a senior position in his local church. Married, children, <laughs> no one suspected him, no one found him, he, do he accidentally dobbed himself in. So what I'm getting at here, guys, don't think we're finished with the Avery and Dassey cases, right? I'm not saying a serial killer committed this crime, but don't, discount it because btk was silent i think for 10 years and then he came back so all sorts of weird stuff goes on all right guys well again guys thank you so much 
for everyone in chat. Thank you for attending. Thank you to all my panel members. Uh, if you like what we've done, uh, please subscribe to the channel. If you like the podcast, give us a thumbs up. It is very much appreciated. Thank you, guys. And uh, we will see you all next week for the next episode. Thank or you. Or in March or April, if you get the book, you'll disappear and go uh, down that rabbit hole. Yes. Yes. That's another rabbit hole. <laughs> Correct. Correct. All righty, guys. This has been a Foul Play production. Thank you.